Broadcasting from Century Studios in downtown Regina, Harvard Media presents the all-new Sports Cage, where Saskatchewan comes to talk local sports. Brought to you by Nelson Homes, supplying home packages and RTMs for over 65 years. Be a part of the show. Call 1-866-767-0620 or text 306-936-6262. The all-new Sports Cage. Streaming at sportscage.com and on the radio at 620 CKRM. El lanzamiento viene al plato. ¡Batazo! ¡Feliz Navidad! ¡Feliz Navidad! romantic about baseball last night wow. big christmas john kenzie noel it's a two-run bomb for the cleveland guardians to tie the game in the ninth inning against the new york yankees and then for whatever reason i think a lot of us especially following on on social media that was going to be the highlight of the night and then what was it 10 minutes later in the 10th inning david fry hits a two-run walk-off home run to win it for the guardians in game three fry deep drive left field fry's watching it is a walk-off home run david fry lights up the cleveland night guardians end up winning that game 7-5 now trail the yankees in the alcs two games to one first pitch tonight is going to go at 6-0-8 over in the National League, the L.A. Dodgers beat the Mets 10-2, to and they lead the NLCS three games to one. First pitch here is just going to be in a couple of minutes. Hey, it's Chris Masrick along with the voice of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, Dave Thomas. We're doing the uh, all-new sports cage today. Uh, it's a busy show. We're going to have a special Friday edition of Double Talk with Darian Durant coming up um, just after 5 this afternoon. But we've got to go out on the Western Pizza guest hotline. Dave, this is a guy you've known for a long time, and he's watched – some interesting football this season. We go to the donut box in Hamilton to bring in, well, he's a Sasky guy by trade, RJ Broadhead. Welcome to the all new sports cage. RJ, how you doing this afternoon? Good, Chris. Good, Dave. Good to be with you guys. Good to be back in Sask. Well, now we give us a put little a bunny, bunny hug on little... for you today, just so you know. So that, yeah. that's what it's all about here. <laughs> oh, two of them, finally two, speaking we... my language. Finally, I can I can say bunny hug again. I don't have to say hoodie. It's great. Yeah, you're in the land of bunny hug. You don't have to worry about that. Um, now, RJ, you're the voice of the Hamilton Ticats, but a lot of us knew you from here in Saskatchewan. You were the voice of hockey. Can you rewind? Let's go through your resume a little bit. Where did you start? What did you start doing? And how do you end up there? Well, it's it, you have to rewind quite a ways. Uh, Next year will be 30 years in the business. Called my uh, first game in the Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League with the Kindersley Clippers. I uh, went on to uh, work in Saskatoon, did some work with the Blades. Uh, uh, Dave is very familiar. I think uh, you came in after me, Dave, at uh, a radio station there. But uh, um, yeah, then went to, to Sportsnet and did a little everything there from uh, uh, lots of hockey, uh, Hockey Night in Canada, uh, eight Memorial Cups I called, uh, did a lot of soccer, I did a couple of Olympics, and and uh, the Hamilton Tiger Cats started their own own network, really. Uh, you know, the radio rights weren't super lucrative, so uh, they wanted to give this a shot. I think a, a lot of teams in other leagues have fallen in, along the Tiger Cats' footsteps in, in doing this, but it's been... Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I was the first hire of the, of the Ticats Audio Network, so that was um, quite an honor. And it's it's been an interesting four years doing it. This will be our first year not calling any playoff games. Yeah, definitely something that has been unfamiliar for you. And uh, first and foremost, the audio network that you put together, you, you put a great product together. Is it more of a challenge or less of a challenge when you can go ahead and kind of decide what you want the content to be? <laughs> uh, that's a good question, Dave. It's, uh, you know, we want to be fair because uh, we do work for the team, but still sports fans are smart. 
So you, you can't pull the wool over anybody's eyes. So you have to do it with honesty and integrity and, and you know, some, especially early on this season, we were talking about a lot of the same things, a lot of the same mistakes with too many penalties, too many turnovers. Uh, the defense was, was struggling, but there have been a lot of positives too. Uh, you know, maybe Bo Levi Mitchell gets to 5,000 passing yards. That could be exciting. It is, it is uh, very Ticat uh, centric, but um, yeah, we do the content, but we have some great people. Luke Tasker is uh, um, the son of Steve Tasker. He does the color commentating. He's just a, a fantastic guy, very, very smart. And Mike Daly is also one of the, the analysts, one of the main analysts. And, uh, and he was a great, uh, great safety for the Tiger Cats. And, and he's got that edge, that football player edge that, um, that is, is good and needed and opinionated. So, uh, you know, we talk about all the teams, but it's, it's definitely Tiger Cats focused and uh, we're fair. I, I've, I've, you know from calling games, Dave, um, if you have both sides, what I was calling games, say a Memorial Cup, if both teams thought I was a homer, I knew I was perfect. So uh, uh, with this, you can be a little more, it's the first time I've actually, for a long time, called games for a, for a specific team. So it's kind of nice in that sense that I, I can get a little overexcited when, when the Tiger Cats do something. It's RJ Broadhead. He's the voice of the Hamilton Tiger Cats on the Western Pizza Guest Hotline here on the All New Sports Cage. It's Maz and Dave Thomas. Now, you mentioned Bo Levi Mitchell. We covered fashion. Dave and I are both wearing bunny hugs. RJ, unless you've taken off the top part, I don't see you wearing Boveralls, which is one of the best stories to come out of the CFL this year. Tell me you at least got in on the ground floor and you've got some copyright to get paid on the back end. Oh yeah, well I grew up on a on an acreage in Saskatchewan, so I've had, I've had uh, boveralls all my life. So they they're just back in the closet. I, I had to suck in a little bit to get them on now, but uh, yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, we we joked around that that Bo could have had a really nice hat or a, a beautiful jacket that started this streak and the the winning streak that he could have worn every game, but it happened to be overalls and got nicknamed boveralls. I, I had already committed if there was a playoff game, I was going to wear the overalls. So unfortunately, there's no playoff game, but uh, fortunately, I don't have to wear them. <laughs> <laughs> RJ, my opinion was at one point this season that the Edmonton Elks were the best 0-7 team in football history. They were just so close. Hamilton is six and ten right now. Do they deserve to have a better record than what it shows? Yeah, they blew some games early on, Dave. That uh, it's really come back to haunt them. I, I'm, I'm convinced they're going to miss the playoffs by a point. I, I think Toronto beats Ottawa tomorrow, and then the Tiger Cats play Ottawa in the final game. That tie against Saskatchewan that Ottawa had is is going to get them into the playoffs. That was that was an odd game. Both teams thought they won, and then. Nobody won. So uh, as it turns out, that's a huge point for for the Red Blacks. Uh, one of the games the Tiger Cats that cost them was against the Red Blacks early in the season. They had a, a four. Uh, they had a lead, sorry, a, a one point lead with 20 seconds to go. And they did a squib kick on the kickoff. And Ottawa ended up needing one first down and then Lewis Ward kicked a field goal to win it. Uh, that, that was one that really cost them early on against the Riders. They, they blew a, blew a big lead, but the defense was allowing too much early on. And Chris Jones has come in. I know Riders fans are very familiar with him. He's done a great job with his Tiger Cats defense. He's really simplified things and they've been a lot better, but as it turned out, it was just a little too late. So when it comes to the Hamilton Ticats, and it was hard watching early in the season because there was some drops, like Bo was putting the ball right where it needed to be. And, you know, that sadly it, it goes on the quarterback stats as an incompletion or whatever, but then yeah. the team. But when they got rolling um, and they they looked good, Bo Levi Mitchell ends up getting benched, and then he's on social media with the lemonade stand pick with his kids, which I thought was hilarious. And I love Bo because Bo is Bo. He's got a personality. Love it or hate it, 
th- that's what you get. And then the next week, because of the injury to Powell, he's back in there and playing. Is he just a cool cucumber to be like, he knows what he needs to do when he needs to do it and all he can tune out all the other noise, like getting benched and all of that to be like, all right, I'm back in chin strap on. It's time to go to work. Yeah. You know, Maz, there's two ways you can go as an athlete. He, he could have packed it in and said, okay, well, you guys bench me. I, I don't really care. Or show that, hey, I am the guy. I am the best on this team. I should have never been benched. And that, that's a true pro. That's a Hall of Famer. He's been a lot better since that happened. And I, I guess it's a lesson for all of us. And so often there are life lessons in sports that, you know, Things aren't always going to go your way, but when you have a chance to prove yourself and con- to control what you can control, you do it. And one thing that was really haunting Bo early on in the season, you said the drops, those were obvious. They, they weren't, you know, 50-50 balls. They were clear drops. Um, uh, so that, that was definitely frustrating, but he, you know, he's known as a gunslinger and he would take some chances and those chances more often than not earlier in the season were not working. He has not been taking those kind of chances since he was benched for Taylor Powell and then came back in. He's been protecting the football, and that's been a a big key to to his success. It really baffled me how how Bo was kind of the scapegoat, I thought, at one point. If you look at his numbers, right, and he even has a game in hand, so to speak, on Zach Caleros, but he leads him by over 500 yards in passing this year in the Canadian Football League. It, to me, boggles my mind how some of that attention was on him. Is it being entirely his fault? But moving forward, is this Bo Levi Mitchell's team, or is that yet to be determined? He's got another year left on his contract. So my answer would be it's Bo Levi Mitchell's team. I do know he's going to start tonight against Calgary. We know that it's a, it's a meaningless game in the standings. Both teams are going to miss the playoffs, but Bo, he needs both. About 470 yards to get to 5,000 and uh, passing yards, that is. And so he's going to get a chance to start. We'll see how it goes. We will see Taylor Powell at some point. Um, I would think that going into next season, it is Bo's team unless something crazy happens. We saw a lot of Taylor Powell last season as a rookie. We haven't seen a lot of him this year. He had a chance and then. You know, injuries come up, and uh, and that put Bo back in. Then Bo's been great. So, going forward with a year left on his contract, my guess at this point is Bo Levi Mitchell is going to be the starter of the Hamilton Tiger Cats in 2025. And I would also be surprised if he's not the Tiger Cats nominee for most outstanding player this season. Yeah, uh, we're chatting with R.J. Broadhead. He's the uh... The play-by-play voice of the Hamilton Ticats. He'll be busy tonight calling the game. Ticats and Stampeders. It's on the Western Pizza Guest Hotline here on the all-new Sports Cage. All right, RJ. You're from Saskatchewan. Put your green-colored glasses back on. Tell us what you like about this year's version of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Well, one thing that stands out to me is is ball protection. Uh, plus 25 in, in the turnover ratio is... is envious for every other team it's it, it's funny we talk about it all the time because turnovers are, overs have been such an issue with with the tiger cats and they're minus eight at one point they were starting to get close to even and that was good but to be to be plus 25 you're going to win a lot of football games uh w- when you protect the ball like that so that's that's been a big key uh you know the, the riders are they're great Lord, a ton of depth um, you really don't have any holes. Um, a healthy Trevor Harris is is as good as there is. He's he's ripped the Tie Cats apart uh, many many times. So we've seen Trevor Harris at his best. Scott Milanovic talks about him all the time. He was a guy who uh, Scott Milanovic coached at one point, and and Milanovic has that reputation as a quarterback uh, guru and and grooming a lot of the guys. So. Um, I, I like the riders. I'm happy. I'm happy where Saskatchewan is. And um, I know what I'm cheering for when the playoffs come around. RJ, I, I hope you don't get upset at this line of questioning. I know that uh, Tara, your lovely <laughs> sister, and, and Harv, your brother-in-law up in Saskatoon, I'm sure have filled you in. We're in the middle of an election campaign. And I, I want to see where your vote 
is going to lie. Of course, we're talking about the campaign for Roland Milligan oh. Jr. as MLP. Oh, okay. Nice. <laughs> D- Ooh, legit nice. shot. I, know I didn't know where you were going, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> legit shot for MOP, or is that just noise that we're making here in Saskatchewan? No, no, I think it's a legit shot. I, I talked about the, the turnover ratio. He's a big reason why uh, the Riders' turnover ratio is so good. And when you, when you have a guy like Roland Milligan, what he's doing, it affects the other team's offense. They Their game plan is to try to avoid throwing that ball in that direction. So I I, I think when you can affect another team's game plan and you're getting results like he is, I think it's legit. Yesterday we had Glenn Suter on, and he was talking about how he thought that Toronto was in a really good position to go far in the playoffs, potentially win the Grey Cup, because they can stop the run against anybody, especially Winnipeg. You get to see the Argos more than, you know, we do, and you've seen them for years, even when Corey Mace was there. Would you agree with Suits in how good they are when it comes to that uh, defensive line? Yes, uh, I do agree. I, b- before I fully answer that question, Maz, there, there is a consolation prize for Tiger Cats and their fans is that uh, the Tiger Cats swept the season series, all three games against the Argos this season. So they're not going to make the playoffs, but beating the Argos, a lot of Ticats fans are are happy in, at, with, with that result. The Argos, we saw it against the Bombers. Uh, so to put some perspective, the Bombers came in here two weeks ago. Ticats had a bye last week, and they they just dominated the Ticats 31 to 10. They looked great. So there wasn't a Tiger Cat or a Tiger Cat fan that thought the Argos were going to go into Winnipeg and hold the Bombers to 11 points. And you go back to that first quarter uh, goal line stand uh, where they stopped Williams twice, first from the two, then from the one, and kept them out of the end zone and turned the ball over on downs. Even a field goal would have would have at least been a, a tie game when you factor in the results. Touchdown probably would have won it for Winnipeg. Earlier in the year, the Argos stopped the Ticats five times on the goal line in a row. In a row, it was, uh, uh, they stopped him twice, took a penalty, stopped him two, stopped him three times, took a penalty, stopped him two more times, and then Ticats said, that's it, we're to kick in a field goal. <laughs> and and when they took that penalty and the Ticats had three more cracks at it from the one, I said to Luke Tasker, I said, there's no way they're going to stop them six times from the one. <laughs> and he just looked at me and said, I don't know if you should say that. And sure enough, five times in a row. And Scott Malevich said afterwards he'd seen that once before in his career, which I thought was amazing. Like, that's pretty rare for that to happen, but he, he just gave up and kicked the field goal. So the Argos are pretty dominant. It's tough to stop those short yardages uh, and to do it against Winnipeg twice in a row, to do it against the Ticats five times in a row. Yes, they can stop the run, and I, I do agree with Glenn Suter that uh, – that they're in a pretty good spot, and I think they're going to be hosting a playoff game. We'll see what happens tomorrow. That's a big one. If they beat Ottawa, they'll host, and and that'll be an advantage for them. You know, go back to week two. We were at Tim Hortons Field, the Rough Riders and the Hamilton Tiger Cats, and you and I had a conversation. I don't know if you recall this off the air or not, but you said the Tiger Cats cannot afford to have a slow start because Ottawa is no more a free space on the bingo card. And you called yep. it right there. And I would su- I would submit to you then that you're not surprised with the success that Ottawa's had this season. Are you surprised though that they're stumbling a little bit down the stretch run here? So yeah, I, I do remember that conversation, Dave. And eight and ten has got the Tie Cats in the playoffs the last two seasons. They could win out and be at eight and ten. We know they're going to miss the playoffs, so there isn't that uh, weak link in the East Division this this season. Uh, Ottawa was here four or five weeks ago, and they had eight wins and one tie at that time. And I looked at their schedule, and I said to some of the people here, I said, Ottawa could lose out. They might lose every single game remaining this season. And if the Tiger Cats can keep winning, that final game of the season in Ottawa could decide who's in and out of the playoffs. And as it's shaking out, Ottawa hasn't won they had a really, and in, in the defense, the reason why I said that is is they had a really tough schedule down the stretch, but they took care of business early on, um, and 
you know, I think Ty Cats fans are a little bit have a soft spot for Ottawa because Sean Burke is the GM there. He was here in Hamilton. Uh, fantastic guy. He's done a great job with the Red Blacks. A lot of former Tiger Cats are, are now on the Red Blacks because, of course, Berkey's familiar with them. So there's a there's a, a little bit of a, a connection. So yeah, I, I think there are some Tiger Cats fans that that are are happy the Red Blacks are in. They'd like Tiger Cats to be in, but uh, Sean Burke is a is a good person. He, he's got his team in a good spot. I think they're going to be on a losing streak going into the playoffs, but. Hey, you get in and anything can happen. Well, you talk about former Thai Cats in new places. Uh, one guy I did want to ask you about, RJ, was Jameer Thurman because mm-hmm. he has been sensational with the Riders this year. There's a picture online of you and him having a one-on-one conversation. Just, again, great person, great football player. Uh, he comes to Saskatchewan this year. How badly does Hamilton miss him in the middle of that oh. defense? Huge, huge. I... I, for one, and I haven't investigated any further, but I was shocked when when the Tiger Cats didn't cement him in. Um, I'll, I'll admit that uh, Simone Lawrence last year won uh, Most Outstanding Defensive Player. I voted Jameer Thurman. I would talk to Jameer, and even if they had a great game, it wasn't good enough. But it wasn't in a in a condescending way. It was just his the way he is. We have to be. There, you can always be better. You're never perfect. We can work on things. Yeah, we had a good game, but there's more to give. And I, I just love that about him. So I always, I would, I would always pull Jameer aside and, and have a conversation with him and, and <laughs> try to get the seriousness. You, you probably talked to him a few times. He, he can be serious and, and try to get the smile going. And, uh, and I, I, I'm a huge Jameer Thurman fan. Great signing for the Riders. He is... He probably doesn't get the recognition he deserves in, in the CFL. No. Uh, teams that have him know how good he is, but it has been um, a big loss for the Tiger Cats defense to not have Jameer Thurman and great get for the Riders. I, I'm going to say, I'm going to go a step further. The uh, team that is playing the Tiger Cats tonight, they're really kicking themselves they ever let Jameer Thurman walk away, the Calgary Stampers. Yeah. RJ Broadhead, you got about an, an hour in 32 minutes until kickoff, you've got work to do. Thanks for doing this. Please come back. Let's do this again. Uh, you can pretend you're a tie cat person, but we'll always get you back to Ryderville because it doesn't take that long or whatever. Um, and uh, those both, it's funny. You'd mentioned them. They were, they were just overalls to us growing up as kids, usually GWG, and now they're overalls, and they're probably designer, and they'll cost 300 bucks. But you know what? Hey, listen, if you didn't shop at Army and Navy downtown Saskatoon as a kid, maybe mom and dad were doing something wrong, you know? I was there. Or, I was there. I know. And sometimes you'd get rubber boots at PV Mart just because they were on sale, and they had a whole bunch of them. So why wouldn't you get two pair, one a bigger size for the next year? Oh, I'm oh, home. Man. I'm home. <laughs> ah. RJ, thanks. Uh, have a great call. This is the all-new Sports Cage. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, uh, Mark McConkie is going to join us. they got a tall task ahead of them this weekend, the Regina Thunder taking on the Saskatoon Hilltops. He'll be on with us just after 4 o'clock. If you want to have a little fun now and do a little winning with the Sports Cage, grab your phone and text the word RIDERS, R-I-D-E-R-S, and then 936 and you got a chance to uh, I I sorry I it's, it's did Scott it, McCauley say, coming from the Thunder. Scott McCauley. No, I just say Mark what did I say that? Sorry. I'm Well, McConkey's with the Rams. They're going to they're going to Saskatoon too. They got a pretty ah, big yes, so everybody. As well. duh, they're all taking the same bus anyways. Uh we got rider to switch. We'll take a break. Uh, we'll be back. It's the all-new Sports Cage on 620 CKRM. Did I hear that commercial right? Double C's is Ravine. That can't be the same Ravine that we would have grown up with Davis kids. Like th- That's got to be like, would that be his son or something like that? Because the man they call Ravine in the 70s and 80s, he was an older dude then. But, but he was the guy that would come in thing. early in the new year, right? Because he'd do the stop smoking thing, right? Yeah, the Wasn't stop that Ravine? smoking Ravine. Yeah, Curtis or Colson, can you uh, ravine? You guys probably have no idea, but he is like a legend of like he's a hypnotist from back in the day. Ravine, um, the impossible. Yeah, he would cut. Co- yeah, yeah. Well, that but that can't be him. Would that be his son? 
Uh, a second let, generation. Let me, let me keep looking because yeah, you someone keep named looking. Ravine uh, is okay. coming to the Connexus Art Center, and yes, I don't we know. know if it's we the know same that. Or not. Okay, but there. So there's probably that has to be a, a different generation of Ravine because Ravine was an older guy when we were kids, Dave. Like he would have been I never in had fifty six. See, I was in Waver, and I, I lived a sheltered life. I never had a chance to go see Ravine. Yeah, but you probably heard the commercials. Oh, oh my God, Ravine would have been coming to Regina. Exactly. The man they call Ravine. Speaking yes, of overalls and Saskatchewan memories. Holy wow. smokes. Uh, hey, um, out of all the things going on in the NHL last night, it's funny. When, when you're from Saskatchewan, you're never not from Saskatchewan. And when anything comes up, you kind of feel like you have a little part of it. Luke Shen played his thousandth NHL game last night. And you look at him and you're like, wow, it's been a thousand games so far. His first one was a, as a Leaf. Last night he was suited up for the Nashville Predators. And you know the family, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Great Saskatoon family. Luke, his brother Brayden, of course, won a Stanley Cup with the St. Louis Blues. Uh, as a matter of fact, I coached his his cousin and you'd see his dad at the school picking up the kids for lunch every day. A real cool guy. And cool story for for luke shen and this this story actually is about brian burke in my eyes but remember brian burke drafted luke shen to the toronto maple leaves and so Mm -hmm. luke went to toronto as a, a real young guy and so i don't know if you recall this or not but in his first season in Toronto, there was a lot of talk as to whether or not they were going to send him back to junior and it was really weighing on him and you could see that in his play well During the World Junior Hockey Championship that was being held in Saskatoon that year, I had the privilege of being on the broadcast for that. It was incredible because all the NHL general managers come in to see the prospects or the World Juniors, right? And so Brian Burke had agreed that he was going to go ahead and he would definitely come on our show and do an interview and talk about anything that we wanted to. There was so much going on in Toronto at the time. So Brian Burke agrees. And so my job was to go and pick Brian up and then to bring Brian with me to our broadcast location so that we could then do the interview and then go about our merry way. And Brian on the way has his phone go off. That's not abnormal. A general manager in the NHL, of course his phone's going to go off over the Christmas break. His phone goes off and he says, okay, I'm guaranteeing you I am going to do this interview. I just have to take care of something. I'm going to be 10 minutes. If you wait for me right here, then we'll go and do the interview. And I thought, okay, he's blowing me off. Terrific. But what it was is he had went ahead and he had got a call from someone close to Luke Shen. And so what he did was he agreed to meet his parents in the stairwell of SaskTel Center up in Saskatoon prior to this hockey game of the World Juniors. And so Brian Burke met with his parents, wanted to reassure them, hey, you know what? We know that Luke is young. We've been telling him he's going to stay. We're here to commit to you as well. We're not messing him around. We are going to have him stay in Toronto all year. There is no way he's coming back to the juniors. He's not being sent anywhere. He's not being dealt anywhere. We just want to talk to you. So he arranged the meeting to go ahead and meet Luke's parents just to go ahead and reassure them prior to anything else happening. And and I'm like, wow, Brian Burke just took time out of his day to go and meet with the parents of a player on his team to make them feel better so that they can make Luke feel better. So I, I felt great for brian but boy can you imagine being luke then no i mean when you hear that story and knowing eric francis a little bit he always speaks so highly of brian burke not just not as just as a hockey professional but just as a person and there's a million stories like that almost non-typical nhl gm type stuff to where it's like no berkey he cares about the person first and then the hockey or whatever you're talking about comes second. Like I, he, no matter where he's been as a GM, he still does charity events in a lot of those cities that he doesn't even live anymore because he's making a contribution to the community. So um, that, that, that doesn't surprise me uh, to do that. It's funny. Uh, the Shen brothers and uh, like a lot of us, they play hockey the right way. Uh, oh. The, the real way. Like there's no, yeah. no matter how the game has changed, and when you read about him getting his thousandth game, he had three different stints in the American Hockey League when he was trying to get his career back on track. So it hasn't been he's been in the NHL the whole time and stayed up like he's really had to grind for a while there to kind of get back to a good spot. And well, um, he's got a very young family as well, right? Like him and his wife had kids a little bit later. And so 
can you imagine him juggling? Because how many times has there been talk about him being moved to the trade deadline, right? And the one time he was in Vancouver and his wife was expecting, and it was like, what, what am I going to do here? Like, I'm a hockey player. I know this is what I signed up for. But again, he's moved his family around the continent, right? Like from Vancouver to Tampa Bay to Nashville. Again, what a list and what an accomplishment. Again, a thousand games is nothing to sneeze at for a Sasky kid. Well, it doesn't surprise me. A good Sasky guy like Barry Trotz has got a good Sasky guy like Luke Shen on his roster because you know what? Them, I you know Nashville hasn't been great the past couple of years. Underachieve, and if they are with Stam, although they lost last night to the Oilers. Um, what? Who is it? UC Soros has more points than Stephen Stamkos. <laughs> UC Soros, yeah. the goalie, has the more points than yeah. Stephen. Stamkos, yeah, there was 11 games in the NHL last night. The Oilers won. Oiler Nation is kind of calmed down a bit, although you beat Nashville. Um, they always beat Nashville. We should preface that. I right? know they, I know they do. <laughs> Only three games in the uh, in the NHL tonight. Carolina's at Pittsburgh. San Jose's at Winnipeg. I know who I'd be betting on that game. <laughs> and call it. Colorado's at Anaheim, and I want to get your take on this. So uh, there's, it's, it's no secret that the GM in Anaheim does not necessarily love Trevor Zegras like the administration that drafted Trevor Zegras. Okay? Mm-hmm. It's almost like a take him or leave him. And he's still there, but I was just thinking, I wonder if Trevor Zegras will become, if he does get dealt from Anaheim, is he going to turn into the next kind of like Tyler Toffoli? A lot of talent, but he'll he'll only be on teams a year and a half or two because Tofo- like Toffoli has been a real suitcase and he's good wherever he goes, but he doesn't stay long. And I, I kind of think, is Trevor Zegras going to have that trajectory as well? That's interesting because I, I there's got to be a story behind Toffoli, doesn't there, with the number of times he's moving? But like he signed the long-term deal in Montreal a year, two years ago now? And yeah. he expected to be in Montreal for a long time. He was setting up roots and then he got dealt again. And I'm like, there's got to be something here. But you're right. He is so good at what he does. He plays such a key role, especially on the power play, right? Like he will take time and space away from the defenders to go ahead and make his play for a teammate or put the puck in the net himself. Yeah, guys seem to love him. He scores yep. goals wherever he goes. But for whatever reason, the GMs are like, and and the other thing too, like I I heard some other sports radio today, and they were talking about Mitch Marner and his no move clause and all that, and I was just thinking of like Tyler Toffoli. I know maybe your agent asks for it every time, and you don't get it. But you should probably put a no move clause in in one of these contracts here, because can you imagine uh, Luke Shen's wife? Could you imagine Toffoli's wife? How many times yeah. she's had to pack up the Tupperware and refold the clothes and put them in a suitcase? Because we're out of here again. Yeah, no doubt. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, speaking of Sasky guys, I know that this is kind of going off on, on a little bit of a tangent uh, for a moment, but I got some sad news this afternoon that I thought I'd just share a story. Uh, Bruce Vance, he's done so much for sports in our province. He was up in Prince Albert with the Raiders hockey team for a long time as their business manager. So as a young guy in the Western Hockey League, which I was a while ago, He would go out of his way to make sure that you were welcome. And he did that with everybody that he met. And again, he, he did so much in the softball world and female hockey. Of course, his daughter was a fantastic goaltender that went on to play for the U of S Huskies. And he's been fighting for uh, fighting cancer a number of years and, and lost his battle with, with cancer and the terrible disease today. But as he's affectionately known, Bagger Vance would would go out of his way to do anything for anybody. And again, if he could lend a hand or make a difference, he, he would. So, just a real cool person i know that his wife leanne the kids you know are have been helping him out through this battle and this journey that he's been on that he's actually been using to inspire others as well you can find his blog online and it's simply sensational just what he's been doing for others so uh bruce vance and his family we are thinking of them today as well as the prince albert raiders organization last year they enshrined him on their wall of fame which i thought was really cool and a very classy touch by the raiders so uh bruce uh, to your family we're, we're thinking of you today it's a busy night in the western hockey league the regina pats are actually off until tomorrow they'll host the seattle thunderbirds and we'll have the game right here on 620 ckrm we'll have our pregame show with dante to carry at 6 30 and then face-off goes at 7 o'clock. Time to take a break. When we come back, 
what did you think of the Thursday nighter between the Denver Broncos and the New Orleans Saints? And what are things setting up for this weekend? Will the 5-0 and Minnesota Vikings finally meet their match against the Detroit Lions? Stick close. It's the all-new Sports Cage on 620 CKRM. Hey, we've got a special Friday edition of Double Talk coming up just after 5 with Darian Durant. We'll get his thoughts about uh, what Plaza of Honor weekend was like for him, what he thinks about the games in the CFL this weekend, maybe a little playoff preview but uh darian will join us just after five and then uh come monday he'll be back to his regular time slot uh it's maz and voice of the riders dave thomas filling in for barney who's going to be back next week um double c's curtis and colson did we get a ravine update where are we at with is this old ravine or new ravine uh, okay so this is new ravine at the connexus arts center officially the okay they call it ravine the legend continues uh, so okay. Peter Ravine was the original Ravine. Mm-hmm. He's actually from Australia. Okay. And he passed in 2013. Good day, mate. Okay. And so his son Tyrone is the, is new, the Ravine new Ravine ah. who is taking okay. on. Fun fact, Peter Jr. was also a guitar in the now defunct band Salty Dog. Wow. Well, now there's something I can go into the weekend with, knowing about that guitar and salty dog. It was, yeah, Old Ravine's son. Old Ravine's son. Re- Should we call him Ravine's senior, maybe? It's- maybe, maybe, yeah. Ravine senior. <laughs> that seems yeah, to have a well, no, because th- well, no, when I heard the commercial, it caught me off guard. I was like, wow, Ravine is still around? That's like when people run into me, like, you're still around? Like, you, they still let you on the radio? Oh. I'm like, okay, but Ravine's been helping people for decades. Yeah. Like lose weight, stop smoking, like act crazy on stage. I mean, I mean, it was nuts. Okay, so th- if that's his son, have you ever been to a hypnotist, Dave Curtis or Colson? I have worked many events because of my old job, so I've seen many of them, but I have never participated. No. <laughs> wow, what a man of many words! Like we got to pay him by the word here. I I have watched, but I am afraid. To be hypnotized. Okay, so I have two hypnosis stories. I've tried to do the thing, you know, where they bring in a hypnotist to a bar and you get a bunch of people on stage. Like, you know, there's 20 chairs and people go up there and some people yeah. can and can't. And and I remember I tried that and the guy's like, I, I you, because you got to calm down your brain. You just, he's like, no, it's just not going to work. So they sent me back to the audience. So it ended up being about 10 people. And one of them was somebody I knew and I was like, and I knew that, they weren't a plant like we didn't get free drinks and free tickets like it was legit and i so i believe in this stuff because some people are like no way everybody's in on the trick not for real and then i ended up going through a connection and there's a really famous hypnotist i, I think she's passed away but she did everything from the royal family. We're talking Queen Elizabeth II and stuff like that. Would be flown over there to Hollywood celebrities. We're talking Johnny Carson and things like that. And she would travel around. And because I had met somebody mutually, they were describing this and said, well, she's booked up years in advance. But maybe call anyways. And so I got on a cancellation list. And so you end up going to her house and it was her daughter and she would have been in her 70s at that time. So you go into this room where she did it and there was a picture of Queen Elizabeth II and there was Johnny, there was all these different celebrities and she would get taken all over the place to do readings. And she hypnotized me and some of the things, there was hypnosis and there was also like a reading. Some of the things that she told me there was no way that she, I didn't say anything. There's no way she would have known some of this stuff. I was still, I'm still blown away to this day. And people will be like, there's no, it's garbage. There's no way. I don't know. That day, it just all seemed to click because I had no answers when I got back in the car. And when I got back in the car, I sat there for probably a half hour. I, I couldn't drive because my mind was just blown to be, wow. I think it was 250 bucks too. I didn't care after that. I didn't care about the money, but, but, but I was like, okay, like that's, that, that's a lot of money. Cause if you were to go to see like ravine's not 250 bucks, if you go to a bar, it's not, you know, it's like 10 or yeah. 15 bucks, but it was, whew, wow. My blood. I wonder what she would have told smoking the at the end of it all or 
Did I? Everybody smoked back then. Probably yes or no. It didn't make me didn't I didn't make any better life choices after that. But it was definitely uh, interesting. So if if you're getting your tickets to Ravine, go, and be yeah. all in. Just be Ravine all Junior. In. Ravine Junior. Wow, Ravine you convinced Junior. me. I can't wait to go to Ravine. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. The guitarist is technically Ravine Junior. Oh, this yeah, is Tyrone. Peter, yeah, this is Tyrone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, NFL action that, last then. night. Uh, I was flipping channels, and by the time I had flipped from baseball over to the NFL Thursday nighter, Denver was comfortably ahead of New Orleans 16 to 3. It was the Bo Nix Spencer Rattler show, and I was like, I don't. And then there was a couple of Keystone Cops plays where Rattler kept fumbling the ball and stuff. I'm like, yeah, I don't think Sean Payton came back and he, he got the better of his old team. Yeah, he, he did. It wasn't close, and yeah, I. I don't know. I, I still thought, you know, in Denver, I looked at him like, you're getting rid of Russell Wilson? Like, what What am I not seeing here? Obviously, what? a lot. <laughs> like, you're, you were a let Russ cook guy? Yeah, I definitely was. I, I, I was shocked. But anyways, when uh, Sean Payton, that, by the way, Sean Payton was up at the dog's breakfast up in Saskatoon. Yes. You'll recall back, uh, when was that, May? Yeah, May. He was there. And... That was the one thing. Don't ask about Russell Wilson. Fair enough. We won't. Yeah, no, I I always thought that Russell Wilson thing in Denver, I, I was like, uh, I don't, even if they would have won, I'm like, yeah, I don't think this is going to work. I think the let Russ cook thing was a Seattle thing. Like, that's where he had most of his success. And now who knows how it's going to play out in Pittsburgh. Um, did you guys see this earlier today? TMZ reporting that former Bears quarterback Jay Cutler got arrested for DUI in Nashville and he on a weapons charge and apparently the story is he was out deer hunting and then he got pulled over oh, <laughs> could we find his mugshot it's good can oh, the double C's find the mugshot we'll, we'll find his mugshot it's good because he looks he, well no one looks, should look, look good in a mugshot well I know um Jay Cutler's funny. Is it true that he like would smoke cigarettes? In the Cutler, because there's always there's always pictures of him with with cigarettes. Now, is that just a is that a bit, or was he actually an NFL player that smoked cigarettes openly? Because there's lots of pictures of him floating around online that he smokes while he was a quarterback. It's just it's just it's funny those old you you know the stories of Gila Fleur smoking and you know in the older generation but not the young generation there, there's no way that any of these young guys are going to do that so that's why it's kind of funny I would agree yeah I, I, I think yeah Gila Fleur was the most famous guy that I can recall with the stories about his his smoking but there's there's other football players and stuff for sure that have done it along the way Ray Elgard. Um, this weekend, the big matchups, the game oh. that everybody has got circled. The 5 0 Vikings taking on the Minnesota, the 5 0 Vikings taking on the Detroit Lions. Uh, Arash said yesterday that he thinks if, if, if it's all going to come crashing down for Minnesota, that this is the game and this is the team that could do it because Detroit is going in the right direction. Not that Minnesota hasn't, and we'll see because if the Vikings do end up winning, You'd have oh. to consider them legit because then they've actually beaten some good teams, and the beatdown that Detroit put on Dallas isn't as, Dallas is not exactly world beaters. So, <laughs> but the, and that should be the best game of the weekend and the worst game of the weekend. And we mentioned this yesterday on the show as well: Patriots and Jags. Yeah, don't bother getting up one. at seven in the morning to watch that. That that's gonna be that's gonna be a tough watch. All right, uh, we're gonna take a break. When we come back on the all-new Sports Cage, it's Friday. And what that means, Friday Night Lights for Regina Motor Products. We'll give you a rundown of the big high school football games going on in the province. If there's anything we missed, you can always shoot us a text or a quick email. Oh, there we go. There's Jay. If you're Jay watching Cutler, the stream, yeah. it's sportscage.com. Colson, I want that to be your new profile picture on Twitter because you're just, <laughs> you don't even have a profile picture. Step Put that away. up because all you have is a C. <laughs> But all you have is a C. Uh, we'll take a break and be back. It's the all-new Sports Cage on 620 CKRM. In about an hour's time, we'll have a special Friday edition of Double Talk with Darian Durant. Uh, Doubles was inducted into the Ryder Plaza of Honor last weekend. We're going to chat with him about that. 
and what he thinks about the uh, CFL games going on this weekend. So stick around. Uh, speaking of the Riders, they were getting some um, big time shout out today from uh, some celebrities. We'll let you in on that before five o'clock. It was pretty neat. It was a guy, it, and I had mentioned this a few times before on the Sports Cage about this and there's a little okay. bit of a story behind it so we'll we'll uh we'll we'll get to that hey if you want to be part of the show capital ford lincoln text line you're more than welcome you've got something to say you got a comment uh 306-936-6262 capital ford lincoln saskatchewan's number one ford retailer capital ford lincoln.com now the coaches will never admit to this because they can't because They've got to stay level-headed, humble. They've got to keep the players in line all throughout the season. But to the average football fan, if you would have said, hey, um, at the start of the PFC season, who's going to be playing for the championship? We all would have said Hilltops and Thunder. And um, that's what will happen on Sunday afternoon at SMF Field. Saskatoon, Regina Thunder making the trip north to take on the Saskatoon Hilltops. Scott McCauley, head coach of the Thunder, joins us on the Western Pizza Guest Hotline. Um, Scott, what has the message been since the win over Calgary to get ready for the Hilltops, a team that has beaten you twice so far this year? Well, I think to kind of begin with, like, um, when any games in our league, it's it's not easy. Like, it's all games are, you know, pretty close, and there's a lot of great players and a lot of great coaches, so... Biggest thing is like like one enjoy the win after Calgary, and then two like when we got back trying to get that mindset back into place to to get better and stuff. And we feel that you know the way that we're playing right now compared to maybe the way we we played against uh, Saskatoon the first couple of times is that we're we're kind of a different team where we're doing a lot of different things on offense, defense, and also with special teams with uh, different players in different spots, but also kind of playing with some different schemes that. You know, we basically had to kind of like look at our team and look at our assets and see how we could bring out those assets and put us in better spots to, to, to be successful. Coach, appreciate that you said that. Again, winning a football game is never easy. And we had an opportunity to talk prior to kicking off your 25th anniversary season this summer. And the one thing you mentioned in that conversation was how happy you were with your team's off season and the work that the team had done and put in in the gym and getting bigger, stronger, faster. Have you seen that work pay dividends this season? No, like I think so. Like we had a really good start to the, to the year in regards to our wins, but also like just not a lot of injuries. You know, it wasn't until basically, you know, the Empton Huskies game where we started to see a little bit more injuries starting to compile, you know, pile up and stuff. So um, I think that says a lot with our off-season workouts and what we're able to do with that. Then also even like right now, like I feel like like we're like we're strong across the board, you know, in practice where we haven't really had to slow down the amount of reps we're taking. And then also, you, you know, see with the line playing stuff, like we're still getting some good push. So I think the off season definitely plays into that. And, and also being able to maintain that strength throughout the year is huge as well. So when you look at the Hilltops, if you're going back to look at the um, the game tape of the first two games, what are the, what are like, give us like one or two takeaways from those earlier Hilltops games where, you know, like you said, you're, you're a different team than then. What are some of those areas where you feel like, no, that we either lock that up or we've completely moved on from there? Yeah. I mean, uh, so I guess a few things like that, the Hilltops have actually changed up their game plans quite a bit. You know, and like what they did against us in game one is way different than what they're doing the first three games of the year. Uh, the way that they, they called their, their the second game is a lot different than, you know, they, they, they called their last game. So it's trying to, one, try to figure out what they're trying to accomplish, you know, that particular game. And, um, you know, in game one, they came out throwing and they went to, they isolated 86 by himself quite a bit. And, you know, we didn't make the proper adjustments. And, uh, you know, in game two, we had all that in place. And then they, they really went into more of a ground and pound and delivered the ball to a couple different other guys, right? So, you know, for this game, like, we need to, like, make sure that, uh, you know, we're really paying attention to, like, what they're trying to accomplish, make those adjustments quickly, not wait and see and feel it out because there's, you know, as the game progresses, like, once it gets out of hand, it's out of hand, especially in uh, these types of, types of games. But, you know, for us, it's going to be a lot of complementary football. We're going to have to rely on our offense to move the ball, however which way that is. Um, and the bottom line is that we need them to keep the ball and keep their off uh, the Hilltops offense off the field. Uh, we believe in our defense. We have a great defense, but, you know, Saskatoon has a couple of players that are, you know, home run hitters, right? 
and uh, you want to try to slow down their momentum a little bit and, and take the ball out of their hands. We're down to Thunder. Head coach Scott McCauley, our guest, getting set for the PFC Championship game Sunday afternoon in Saskatoon against the Hilltops. Coach, how much fun is it to coach at this time of year against a team that you're so familiar with in the Saskatoon Hilltops? You talk about the adjustments that you're seeing within the season, and I'm assuming there's going to be adjustments within the game. Is is fun the right word when it comes to setting up a game plan for a game like this? I mean, anytime you can get those extra games in the year, again, like we talked about, like, you know, there's six really strong teams, and like we've been lucky the last four years to to get to the PFC final. You know, we're we're one and two against the Saskatoon Hilltops, and we feel like we have the the chalk in our hands right now that we can make the adjustments that we need uh, to be successful going into this weekend. And like, yeah, it's it's a it's another week of coaching football, and it's coaching at an elite level. And both teams both teams know each other inside and out, so it's trying to figure out sort of like what's that next step, like what sort of wrinkles can you put in, but not cost your team like. Um, you know, they've been working on certain skill sets. You don't have wholesale changes, but what sort of wrinkles can you can you build out of everything, right? So it's it's definitely a fun time of year, but it can be a little bit stressful too because you're wondering what the hell, what, what they're going to be doing, right? Like, I got no idea. They threw it against us. They ran against us. You know, like last year in the, the, the 2022 PSC final, they ran an option play, which they've never ran probably in 15, 20 years, came out of nowhere. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun for sure. Uh, one of the neat things, um, the guy sort of leading the charge for the Regina Thunder, Murad Al Khatib. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, enthusiasm, passion, the ability. He's moving any obstacle in the way, out of the way. And when we had him on the radio, he talked about football being one thing, but the the boys are the men that come into this program. And then when he to see them grow and go on through that, you get these guys from the start until the finish is that one of the more proud things being a coach whether you win or lose to see where these people are turning into as humans when they come through the thunder program yeah i mean it's kind of reflect and look back especially the fifth years and stuff and how far they've grown you know as 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 people you know they might be coming in as this little chubby kid that's you know quiet and you know you know scared to talk to anybody and all of a sudden they're leaving they're all jacked up and they won't they won't they won't stop talking you know so it's it's interesting to see how them 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 kind of grow but you know we've been really lucky to uh have Murad on our on our board of directors also he's been very successful you know in life and he's he's a proud father and a loving husband as well and he brings a lot of like good perspectives to our team like from the business standpoint but also like you know the the Alka teams as a whole, like they're just a good family that always gives back to the community, and and having them around the the clubhouse just makes things a, a lot better. And our players know too, like they can reach out to Michelle or to Murad to talk to them one on one for like life advice and things like that. And then you know also I think we've done a great job with the guy uh, John Tokar. He's our leadership really uh, instrumental of being with the keeping an eye on the guys and making sure that you know we're we're doing things the right way and then helping them grow as human beings. As you gear up for this football game, obviously you've talked about the X's and O's coach. We've talked about the physical attributes. And boy, do you have some athletes, Sadiq Sadiq, just one of the many that were uh, honored with individual awards from the PFC this week. But also, is there an emotion management component that you have to add into your preparation this week and the fact that these guys know each other? Like elite football players in our province, they get to know each other. They get to play and perform against one another in so many different ways. So it's very, I would suggest easy to get up or get down. So is emotions something you also coach this week? 100%. And I think that's one of the reasons why we didn't do so well last time we could do is that, you know, there's a lot of highs and lows throughout the game and, you know, our guys believing in themselves or believing in whatever. And so the, you know, that, that's one of the things is that you need to control those emotions and set some sort of expectations. And that's like the one thing I'm super proud of, you know, like, you know, after those two losses and stuff, you know, I feel like our team's really gelled a lot more. Um, you know, we made the proper adjustments with the X X and, and, and they're bought into that. And you can see that they're fully bought into that. So now it's about managing their, their ability to fly around the field and, and, and make the plays when they, when, when they need to. Right. And so now they can focus on that. Um, you know, I think that's going to be one of the biggest components come game time. Like, who wants it more and who's willing to do more throughout the game, right? Uh, Sarge will get those guys all jacked up. They'll be flying around, being physical, and, you know, uh, 
yelling and screaming and all that kind of good stuff. And our guys are going to be at super high level as well. And whoever can, you know, maintain that and also ride the highs and the lows of the game is going to be the team that comes up on top. And so, you know, we're going to rely on our fifth years. We're going to rely on our veteran players. I've been in this type of uh, game before to, to lead the way and manage that, manage those expectations. Um, and uh, we'll be in a good spot. Do you want to tell me a little bit about Sadiq Sadiq and some of those other athletes? Like I say, it's an impressive bunch. Yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, Sadiq Sadiq, you talked about guys that came here, you know, when they were 18 years of age, coming out of high school and, and, and the type of people they're growing into, like, you know, Sadiq is one of those guys, like he, he hasn't had, you know, the easiest couple of years here um, with his father passing and, you know, on this, you could just see him kind of blossom into that sort of father figure role, not only with his family, but also in the locker room and stuff as well. Like he's, um, you know, he's really matured and become like a, like a, like an adult. And he always was kind of a guy that maybe in, you know, large settings would, wouldn't be the type of guy to talk. And, and now like he's, 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 you know, willing and able to get in front of the guys and kind of call them, call them to order and call them up and, and, and sort of set the way. So he's, he's one guy that I'm, I've been really impressed with like how he's growing. Um, you know, not only as an athlete in this year, like really coming out of his shell, but more importantly as a human being and stuff, he's been outstanding. And then, you know, the person that's right next to him is Rylan Leikert. And uh, Leikert is a, a guy that's absolutely full of energy. Um, you know, he's constantly striving to become the best player, um, you know, like eating good, working out, going to school. Like he's got way, almost like way too much energy. But uh, seeing that guy as well, like just his focus and stuff, they, they, they work well together. Coach Scott McCauley of the Regina Thunder, our guest on the all-new Sports Cage, of course, on 620 CKRM. And, of course, you can see us streaming as well, whether that be on X, on Facebook, on sportscage.com. And, Coach, it's great that we're streaming because I don't think I've ever seen you without a hat before. The flow looks fantastic. But <laughs> in saying that, looking over your left shoulder – uh, there's a couple of boys' pictures back there, and I know you get an opportunity to coach yeah. your boys this year. What has that meant to you? I think it's, you know, it's been a pretty cool experience. Um, you know, it pushed me as a, you know, watch watch how I, what I'm doing and all that kind of stuff as well. You know, like when it's your own kids, you can easily get out for them pretty quick and easy, right? And, yeah. and, and be honest, as from a coaching perspective, that's not always... That's not always fair. Um, it's been, okay. you know, I played in 2001, 2002, and then, uh, you know, I think it came back in 2010, and they would have been about three, maybe four. And I remember bringing them to practice and stuff and setting them up on the garbage cans that we'd set up to run, you know, defensive plays or something with special teams. And then with their long hair and stuff, you know, just sitting on top of these, these cans and not, not understanding what's going on. Or the one time I had them sit in a meeting when they were, I think, four or five, and you know, after <laughs> I thought I did a good speech, got all the boys ramped up, ready to rock and roll, and and then uh, one of them comes up and goes, like, "Good show, Dad." You know, I'm like, "Oh man, it's not a show." <laughs> you, know, you did a good show. That's a really good show. You know, so it was just, it's it's funny just seeing them kind of grow up, and then you know, I've had opportunities to sort of coach them a little bit, you know, as assistant coach or a guy that's you know like a part time coach in hockey or baseball. You know, Thunder always dictates everything, and also my my real job, um, you know, always came first. But they, I was able to coach them in those sports, and I've never really had the chance to coach them in football. So it's it's been pretty cool to have them at the clubhouse, um, see them grow this year as athletes, and also their football IQ grow even more. And then also just see like how they kind of like communicate and and and, and interact with the other players and stuff. And you know, and the other thing too is like you think it. You spend a lot of time with them, but I find I spend less time with them now because, you know, like, um, like they don't want to hang out with me when they're at the clubhouse. They want to hang out with the boys, right? So, um, where they used to come and visit, you know, we could sit down and talk for a bit. Well, you know, that ain't cool. They, they can't be with their old man. So, uh, the bottom line is that I feel like I don't see them as much, but, uh, or I get to spend time with them as much, but definitely see them all the time. Obviously, coaches Probably like that you one. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, no, go, go ahead, Dave. I, uh, I was just, I, I was going to jump in that you could be the head coach and you can be all of those things, but they could always run to mom, uh, your wife, if, if you're ever really getting out of hand or whatever, and they really need the boss to step in and have a word. Oh, yeah. No, she, <laughs> I, she 
You might actually want to win football games more than anybody else in this house. He's been on a rage here this week, trying to get everybody ramped up and ready to go. But uh, you know what's interesting too with her is it's really become a family event. Like, um, you know, she came to the, around the clubhouse during the week of practice and stuff, you know, and, and now she's always kind of around there with the dogs and checking things out. So, you know, it's pretty cool. Like, you know, she'd always be at Winston Oil, their high school practices or RMF practices and never at my practices with the Thunder. And now that the boys are there, all of a sudden she's showing up all the time as well. So it's it's been it's it's been pretty pretty darn good from a family perspective. I've often argued when I've been trying to recruit coaches, whether whatever sport it's been, and my pitch is that as a coach, you're probably gonna get just as much out of it as the kids that you're coaching. So agree with that? Yeah, no, I understand. I mean, you got to do this for for not only the love of the game, but you know the interaction with people and stuff. And I think that uh, you know when you when you start to reflect about the year or the players that have gone, you know, five years to the program, you kind of think about all the things you've learned from them, and it's it is pretty special. And and, and you do learn a lot from the players, and you know everybody comes from from different backgrounds and the way that they interact with people or the way they make decisions and stuff. It's it's always unique, so it's 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 a great learning lesson and. You know, even the other day I was thinking about some of the decisions I made as a coach or, you know, what I've said to guys, you know, with pregame talks or whatever, postgame talks. Like, you know, they changed over the years where I'd be yelling and screaming, trying to get them rocking, ready to rock and roll. And now it's more calm and let the boys take care of it. And, you know, some of the players have, like, sort of taught me, like, hey, like, chill out, man, we got this, you know. So it's, it's uh, you're always learning as a coach for sure. Okay, before we let you go, we told I promised Sheila that we wouldn't tie you up long, Coach, and I appreciate you doing this. Coach Scott McCauley of the Regina Thunder as they get set to take on the Saskatoon Hilltops PFC final Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock. What has to go right for the Thunder to raise a trophy at SMF Field on Sunday afternoon? Well, then I'd be telling you a game plan. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, no, but uh, to be honest, like... Tom Sergeant's it, listening. It, it, Uh-oh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not hard. It's It's... The team that shows up, I mean, playing against them is hard, but winning football games isn't that hard. Like, it's the, the guys that show up and do their jobs and do it the best of their capabilities um, and, and play the full 60 minutes and play with that sort of that grit and that passion is always seems to be the teams that always win, right? And so for us, like, you know, for us to be successful, you know, we need our defensive guys to tackle. You know, we did not do a good job tackling last game against them. Like Corbin Even, he's a great running back, and he got a lot of yards that he should have not gotten if we would have made the tackle on front early contact. So, so that's huge. The other thing too is they got great receivers. How do you find great receivers? You got to attack the hands. You know, they're going to be attacking the ball, attack the hands. Um, you know, it's an opportunity for us to hopefully, you know, not as have as many big plays against. And that's not a big game secret. That's just playing football, you know. Um, for us to be successful, too, like we need to control the clock. And to control the clock, you need to run the ball or not turn over the ball. You know, turnovers kill you. Um, and, and the more that we can keep our defense off the field, which means that our offense has the ball, we're controlling the clock and moving the ball, uh, the more successful we're going to be. So how we do that, you'll see on Sunday. But I think those are kind of like the main themes. And some things like I pushed our coaches on, like, you know, we, we looked at all our assets or inventory within our, our team, players, plays, all that stuff. And I think we put together, you know, a solid plan here the last couple of weeks and we need to continue to do that. And, you know, I don't care how my offense corner just to move the ball, but at the end of the day, we got to move the ball and control the clock. And if we do that, we'll be in a good situation. Well, I can only imagine what the bus ride home will be. You win that game and that trophy, and it's going to be an awesome two and a half to three hours, depending on how long it takes to get through Davidson and stuff. Uh, Coach, best of luck this weekend. The PFC final, Regina Thunder and Saskatoon Hilltops. We're going to take a break and come back. And when we do, the all-new Sports Cage and Friday Night Lights, we're going to take a look at high school football going on around the province as the regular season winds down and some of the playoffs are kicking in and as always if you want to be part of the show you can always call us or text us 306-936-6262 it's the capital ford lincoln text line more sports cage next on 620 ckrm there was a big game at mosaic stadium last night it was the kiwanis bowl martin luther kings ended up beating the saskatoon redhawks final score there was 45 24. That's Sorry, my I alma just like the marching band no music. To... Yeah, that, that, that's my alma mater. They used to be the Redmen back in the day. 
Aquanus Bull. Busy day today. There's games all over the place. Six Man, Davidson's at Watrous. Nipawin's at Foam Lake. Tisdale at Melfort. Maple Creek's at Lumsden. Moose Jaw Vanier's at Shaunavan. Humboldt's at North Battleford. That'll go tomorrow. Some nine-man action at 1 o'clock. Esther Hazy at Melville. And Indian Heads at Fort Capel also tomorrow at 1 o'clock. And here's the thing. Looking at the forecast, this may be the last nice, nicest weekend for football because it could be snowy and rainy by Tuesday, Wednesday with a high of only 5 degrees. And we, we, we talked last week. Yeah. Football practice in that weather is no fun. <laughs> so take advantage. Um, Very true. You've got games... You've got games this afternoon. O'Neill at Campbell, 5.15 at Mosaic. Winston Knoll taking on Levoldis at 7.30. Riffle, Riffle and Miller get the bye this week. Sheldon Williams is taking on F.W. Johnson, 5.15 at Libel. And then Balfour is taking on Tom, 7.30. That'll be the late game at Libel Field. Oh... Right about now, how many, like we just talked with Scott, so head coach of the Thunder, and he talked about his pregame speeches. Sometimes it's rah-rah, maybe kick a garbage can, and now it's kind of calm and cool. Dave, for the, a lot of these high school games that are getting started here in the next few minutes, are we uh, are we revving the gang up and kicking a garbage can? Or, uh, yeah. is Dave <laughs> Thomas, or is Dave Thomas calm and cool delivering the pregame speech to the troops? Dave Thomas, the coach, was always very, what's the word, strategic in his wording going in. The best pregame speech, though, we ever had with a member of the Weyburn Eagles. We're in at halftime, and we had, like, guys going down with injury all over the place. <laughs> and the coach's halftime speech, guys, quit laying on the field. So that tells you about our 0 for season in grade 10. Quit laying on the field. Now get out there. You know what, this one. Friday Night Lights has been a huge success so far this season, and it's because of the moms and the dads and the emails, hi at sportscage.com, and the text to the Capital Ford Lincoln text line. Keep us updated, 306-936-6262. Hey, listen, if you're just even texting in to brag about your kid and not even the other kids on the field, all right, you know what, you can keep sending those in. Uh, and thank you to Regina Motor Products for uh, sponsoring Friday Night Lights or whatever. It's a big weekend for football. Um, and as we talked, it's funny. They start here, six-man, nine-man, 12-man, end up Thunder, Hilltops, guys like Logan Furlan who end up in the CFL. Three games uh, in the in the, in the the league tonight. And if you missed our very first interview of the show, uh, we talked to RJ Broadhead from the Hamilton Ticats. Go check out the podcast because mm -hmm. Dave asks RJ a question and he doesn't know it's coming about voting in the election. <laughs> and I swear I was watching his face. I thought he, he I thought that he thought you were asking him legitimately about the election in Saskatchewan and you were going to be like, what are, what are your political views and how are you going to be voting the, in a couple of weeks here? Man, oh, man. When it turned out to be a Roland Milligan question, I was like, okay. Because I'm like, where's Dave going with this? <laughs> well, and when he was talking about, you know, putting on his overalls, right? Like, the only time you're putting on overalls is to do work in rural Saskatchewan. So it's never fun. It's never good times. It's not a fashion statement like Bo Levi Mitchell. It means that work's coming, right? So, And then your PV Mart rubber boots, that means you're cleaning stalls. So even worse. See, we were lucky because there was farmland, but there wasn't any animals. Um, and I was going to say I was a little soft as a kid. I wasn't necessarily the one that was going to be up there. for. I remember one summer having to paint the fence. And you know what it was like growing up in the 70s and 80s? Your parents were not afraid to fire you from a job, but then rehire you instantly and then make the work conditions even worse. Like you weren't going to get out of it. That's what I'm trying to teach the kids is that when we were growing up, it didn't matter. You were not getting out of it, no matter what or how you acted. You were going to, if mm -hmm. your sentence was to paint the fence, you were painting that fence regardless of how this was going to play out. Yep. You, you know, what's amazing in agriculture is that, you know, in broadcasting, you get an opportunity to do cool things, right? So there was a tractor that was being launched last year up at Saskatoon at Ag in Motion. Actually, that was where I saw some of the crew from here, right, with uh, Sask Ag today. So we're up there, and, hey, do you want to take this tractor for a spin? And I'm like, oof, 
I don't know about that one. But sure, why not? And I climbed in, and I could have sworn that I was climbing into a simulator at Zippy Mart growing up as a kid. Because I had no idea. It was like you were going to operate a video game. Like, good grief. There's so much going on. Like, so, mu so much respect for uh, producers and operators that are running the machinery. But, oh, my gosh, has it changed. First of all, first of all two things. I almost ran over Uncle Carl once getting a chance to drive a tractor don't don't Oops. pit a kid who's like 10 years old on a tractor that's got like a stick ship that is not good you... anyway that was not a good day mm -hmm. what the hell is zippy mart you don't know what the zip well, i guess the zippy mart is is the place in weyburn it wasn't buffalo bills buffalo bills was the big arcade growing up so you'd go to buffs and oh. i didn't go there very often but to give you an idea of how old this was this was an arcade that allowed smoking back in the day so yeah the arcade you, the arcade that we used to go to was called crazy leos and yeah it was kids you'd park your bike outside and you'd go in there and people yeah. were smoking cigarettes and playing donkey kong and space invaders and yeah and zippy and mart was, same deal that was no that was no well no zippy mart sounds like a supermarket or a grocery store that doesn't well, sound like an arcade no there was that component to it as well it, it was a multifaceted facility it still is actually it's it's thriving in weyburn i'll tell you but yeah it is was it like a go gas to is it like a gas is it a gas station and it had arcade games? Is it like a... They had arcade games. They had a little restaurant there. They had a convenience store. I don't think they ever had... I don't think there was ever fuel. Fuel was already always down the street. But yeah, it was... It was the Zippy Mart. You'd go to the Zippy Mart. If you lived on that edge Remember of town, you'd go to the Zippy Mart. And if you didn't, you'd go to Sev. Those are the two options. Um... I remember when games went from a quarter to 50 cents and i'm like no i'm I, i'm playing quarter games who can afford 50 cents like this in this economy even back then there was inflation in video games and you're like yeah i'm out sorry yeah i remember that remember that well and again the one thing that kids today will never have the experience is when you go to the mall and hanging out at the cd store right like oh yeah Andy Never. Sound, Sam the Record Man. I remember Audio Warehouse. Is Audio Warehouse still a thing? Are they still in Absolutely. Business? Crazy Kylie's, yeah. all that? Yeah. Crazy Kylie's just off CDs. 22nd. Yeah. 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 And you'd go and you'd buy CDs. CDs were 15, 16, 99. Remember yeah, cassette like... singles? Remember yeah. you'd be a sucker and you'd make a mixtape for a girl and then she didn't end up liking you anyways and you wasted all that time. There's a lot to unpack there, Maz. I don't know if we've got the time or the couch required. No, for that. no, but nobody, nobody needs to hear that story. There's, <laughs> there's no happy, there's no happy ending there. It's great. Hey, you can be almost fifty-one and in therapy. That's good. Uh, listen, one of the ultimate, ultimate mixtapes of all time. Remember the, so the double C's are gonna look at me like I'm absolutely off my rocker, but remember the mixed CDs, the jock, what was it, jock anthems or jock rock or something, jock, remember, jock jams. Jock jams, that's what it was. They'd have jock jams. So you'd have like in stadium music, and that was the mixed CD that you could go and buy. Mm -hmm. All you guys are mm -hmm. saying is, do you remember this? Do you remember that? No. No. <laughs> don't remember any I don't of it. Remember any of it. I uh the only thing I remember is like the big CDs of like big shiny tunes, you know, like the mm -hmm. much music stuff. Yeah. Big fan of those. Oh, so speaking of this, so my cousin Jay, originally from Saskatoon. Works for Canada Post in Ottawa. He he was a newspaper writer for a long time, and then he got some corporate job at Canada Post. I didn't know Canada Post had writers, but they do. He works there. He's worked there a long time. So did you see that, that came out yesterday? That Canada Post is making commemorative stamps to commemorate much music? Really? Wow. Out of all the things that we spend taxpayer money on, <laughs> this is... When my mom will email or email, will mail a card from some, and it takes seven to eight days to get in the same province, that's to me is a bigger issue than having a stamp to commemorate much music. You know, speaking of taxpayer dollars, so I had a brand new shiny loony yesterday with Prince Charles on the back. I hadn't had one up to this point. Now, it, what's ironic is that there must be something different between the weight of his crown and the weight of Queen Elizabeth's crown because the, the coins aren't the same weight, so it actually gets eaten 
So if you try to use it in a vending machine or a parking meter in downtown Regina, the new loonies don't work with Prince Charles on them. That's or King long, Charles, sorry. That's how long her coins have been around, that the weight of the crown is now not calibrated. Uh, I think that's what it is. That's what oh, somebody... Boy. I was reading this online last night, so of course that tells you what I was doing during that boar fest of a football game. But yeah, apparently the weight's off. So there you go. You're welcome, Saskatchewan. Oh. You're welcome. The, uh, the Pats are going to be back home tomorrow night to take on the Seattle Thunderbirds. We'll have the game here at 620 CKRM with the pregame show starting at 630. We are trying to track down Zach Moore of the Pats to get him on the all-new sports cage to chat about the season so far and uh, what he thinks this team can turn into by the Christmas break and beyond. Time to take another break. It's the all-new sports cage on 620 CKRM. Still to come, Double Talk with Darian Durant. We'll just do that after 5. And if you've missed any of the show, you can always catch up with the podcast on our website at sportscage.com. We talked about this on the show yesterday. When it comes to Major League Baseball, it seems like one day it's a blowout for one team. Uh, the next day it's a blowout for the other team. Bottom of the fourth inning, it's the New York Mets, now nine. The L.A. Dodgers, two. Last night, the Dodgers blew out the Mets, Final score there was 10-2. It'll be interesting to see tonight uh, in game four between the Yankees and the Guardians. Will that walk-off home run spark the Guardians, or was that going to be a blip on the radar for the Yankees and they're going to end up in the World Series anyways? Probably going. I Again, Cleveland's first game at home of the series, right? N- uh, what is it? You never – a series doesn't begin until somebody loses at home is what the, the cliche is, so – Unfortunately, I think that's going to happen for Cleveland tonight. But good on them, right? They were down bottom of the ninth. They get the game-tying home run, oh. and as we heard off the top of the program, if you missed it. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the uh, the uh, game-tying shot, Coulson, and then if, the game winner. Yeah, Coulson, you, Coulson, you don't have to play the whole thing. For anybody that missed the start of the show, can you bring up the Spanish play-by? Dave, I know you do uh, English play-by-play. The Spanish play-by-play of this home run yesterday by um, – well, here's the thing. They call him Noel. His his real name is John Kenzie Noel, and he's called Noel Christmas. Um, and he, I, I didn't know this. He that was a pinch hit. Like he wasn't even playing. Oh, no, they yeah. put him into yeah. pinch hit yeah. in the ninth in inning. Coming in. Oh! See, Classic. sometimes on social media, when you see stuff like that, that just makes you smile because that's just pure elation and emotion. So I don't know. Can they top it? That's funny. That's the beauty of baseball. All of a sudden, you know, the Guardians were down. And what was that New York Yankees pitcher doing throwing to him over the middle of the plate? Like down and away, down and away. Because even and then when they served it up to David Fry, it just looked like he served that one up straight down the pipe. My favorite, I think it was David Wells years ago when he went, where did he go from the Jays to Chicago, right? And so he was pitching in Chicago and they were all over him because he was in a bad stretch and the he was being interviewed after the game because they asked, well, why would you put the ball there? He goes, if you seriously thought I was trying to throw the ball there, then you should probably not be watching the game because clearly that wasn't where the yeah. intention of the pitch was. But yeah, it, oops, ended up there. It's funny. They're not going to show the other 27 pitchers that that pitcher threw. They got no, a bunch no, of guys no. out. They're just obviously going to show the one that got <laughs> served up. Um, I don't know if you saw this earlier today, but the Saskatchewan Rough Riders getting shout outs in the national media. So before the college football season started, we were in Las Vegas and I put some money down on the Georgia Bulldogs who are predicted to be the FCS, the college football national champions Mm -hmm. because that's just they are but then i also put some money down on the texas longhorns coached by former saskatchewan rough rider steve sarkeesian now he wasn't here that long it was only a cup of coffee but i was like whatever man just the fact that he was a rider and now he's the head coach of the texas longhorns 10 bucks can win me i don't know close to 100 if they win so this morning um so tomorrow number one texas plays georgia in austin so the pat mcafee show was there and listen to this before they bring on sarkeesian to talk to him listen what how pat intros steve sarkeesian 
National champion multiple times, hey. head coach of Texas, former uh, Saskatchewan Rough Rider. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah. He's about his mic's Slinging off it. again. Hold on, hold on. There it is. And Saskatchewan Rough Rider. I, we did yeah. not know that till this morning. We looked it up. Dog. Absolute How about dog? That? Underappreciated. Look at. Look at that. Yeah. Doing some research on the Pat McAfee stuff. Nice little shout out for Rider Nation on the Pat McAfee show. Um, do you remember him when he was a rider? Oh, of course. I, I remember him because growing up, I was always the fan of the backup quarterback. So like Tom Burgess was my guy. Then the guy that I'll never forget that I thought was was really, really good and it turned out that I was really, really wrong was Kevin Mason. Remember that name? Yeah. And we had Tino Sinceri yeah. for a while, who I really liked to cheer, Re cheer for. You know, know what I wanted to bring up when we had suits on yesterday? Um, remember Seth Dagey when he got a start and he threw like nine interceptions in the first four <laughs> passes he threw as a rider? It was almost statistically impossible to be intercepted that many. He just had a horrible start, never to be heard from ever again. Remember Seth Dagey? There were some Seth Dagey fans out there. Yeah, Tino Sanceri, Kevin Mason. Who else? Uh, Man, if we could go through some backup quarterbacks throughout the years in Rider Nation, that would be – that's a good text line question. 306-936-6262. Who's been your favorite backup quarterback? So a lot of people thing, not going to admit you... that, though. They're not <laughs> – Yeah, I know, but it's okay now Yeah, in, in the current state. So the, the one thing about college football is that you get a lot of the X – if they've gone on to play pro – you may play for multiple pro teams, but you only usually go to one college before NAL. So the passion is there. And then you get your celebrities too. So Matthew McConaughey has been a, well, he, he lives in Austin. He's a big Texas Longhorn guy. You always see him on the sidelines. He's always down with the coaching staff and with the players. And um, Curtis, we have this ready to go. So this is him yesterday um, on, on Instagram with a little message to Longhorn Nation. October the 19th, 2024, we got a team called the Georgia Bulldogs coming to Daryl K. Williams Memorial Stadium. That's a night game. Ooh, they still the pack. Everyone's going to have time to lose property when you lose right. Big yeah. test of your season. Big, Big test. test. All right. That's the team to beat. We go out there and handle it and continue to play against how great we can be. That's who I even need to play against. While playing them and giving them full respect, um, there's no time for the law. There's no time for the exhale. We obviously will not be, to be hyped up. We will be way up in this game. We just got to play, as Coach Sarkeesian said, play smart, intelligent, and then very tight. Oh, shit. That's what it says. All right, all right, all right. I, I love that. I, I love how he said it's going to be a night game and people are going to be properly lubricated. Like it. Ah, I do like it. That's so good. So that's the, the big game in college football tomorrow. Number one, Texas playing number five, Georgia in Austin. Hook them horns. And here's the thing. It's up. We're not, we don't do it like this where we put the horns down. That's a sign of disrespect. <laughs> yeah. We don't do that. Um, do we have our guy here? Do we have? Yeah, I, I think we do have 18 year old forward from the Regina Pats uh, in his Second season with the Pats on the line with us. Uh, Zach Moore joins us. Good Saskatoon guy. Uh, Zach, thanks so much for taking some time. You excited for this weekend? Yeah, I'm very, very excited. Thanks for having me on here. Well, let's get right down to, to brass tacks uh, for you. Off to a good start this season. Got a couple of goals, a couple of helpers along the way. How do you feel it's been going? Um, Yeah, I think uh, my uh, personal game's been off to a good start. Um the boys are all uh, feeling good, so I think we just got to keep going and get some wins on the board. Well, you have an opportunity to do that with Seattle coming to town tomorrow, 6 o'clock start. Of course, CKRM's coverage starts with Dante DeCaria at 5.30. I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, growing up in Saskatoon and then playing for the Blades before you moved here to Regina mid-season last year. What's that like for a young guy? I mean, it's a crazy, crazy experience for sure. Just uh, kind of I was watching the draft at home with my family and to hear um, my name get called and picked by the Blades, we all kind of had a big celebration. But just being able to uh, be at home and live with my family was a really cool experience. Now, obviously, you've come to Regina. Like I said, you were moved here last season. 
what was that like? Because the Saskatoon Blades had one of their best seasons historically, but the Regina Pats, they wanted you, and they said, hey, okay, we want you to come in and help do that here. What does that mean to you? I mean, it means a lot. Um, just being able to uh, play my game, you know, maybe on a not uh, as successful team last year, but um, being able to play bigger minutes and uh, kind of gain confidence, it was a big help to my game. And just being able to help a team win, is uh, it, it's a real good confidence boost. Now, you went up to Saskatoon earlier this week. A tough outcome as the Blades scored that weird one with 33 seconds left to send it to overtime. How many friends, family members did you have? Because there's a whole bunch of Saskatoon guys on this Pats roster. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think uh, I was looking at it the other day. Um, almost 50% of our team is from Saskatoon. So, yeah, I'd say uh, probably I had 20, 30 people that I was talking to after the game and even guys on the, on the blades I was talking to, cause I'm still pretty close with most of them. So. Hey Zach, it's Maz here. That game. I, I know the record on the season is four and five, but that game the other night. And for anybody that's watched the Pats so far this year, you guys played the blades tough and they're one of the best teams in the league. Although you don't get the win. Does that help with the confidence with the come after playing a game like that going, we can play with the best in the league. We can do this. We just have to do it every night for three periods. Um, yeah, for sure. It gives our team confidence. It kind of shows everyone in the room that we're uh, we're right there with the top teams even our uh, other two games spokane everett we had top two teams in their division at uh, and they're close games so i mean it just goes to show that uh, we're right there and we can play with those top teams zach your schedule is really front loaded as far as being a home schedule it's an opportunity of course to play in front of our fans at the brant center what's it mean uh, getting that opportunity to stay close and have the familiarity as you start a new season. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, every team feeds off their fans' energy, so to be able to have a bunch of home games to start the year, it's uh, it's awesome, and we just got to take advantage of the schedule and put up wins for the fans. Okay, being a Saskatoon guy, I coached in Saskatoon minor hockey for a number of years. I think I actually coached against you. Which zone did you grow up in? Um, I I grew up. I played in a, a two different zones. I started off as a in the wild zone, and then I switched to uh, Red Wing. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we 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 cross paths along the way. Does that come up in the Pat's locker room at all? The zone that you started out with? Um, not so much zones, but going into uh, like Bantam, and when you kind of are citywide, you play against each other and with each other, even so. That, that rivalry and stuff comes up in the room for sure. All right, we're almost out of time. Set up tomorrow night against Seattle. What's gonna, what are we going to see on the ice? Um, you're going to see an action-packed game, I think. It's going to be a physical one, and I for sure hope that uh, everyone here can see a Pats win. Zach, go Renegades. Or sorry, I was thinking about the Saskatoon <laughs> zone again. <laughs> what? Ren Ren Renegades. <laughs> uh, sorry, Wilds, oh. Wild and Red Wings have a, little bit, have a little bit of a rivalry there. Zach, appreciate you doing this. Good luck tomorrow night. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. No problem. So tomorrow night, 5.30 pregame show face-off at 6 right here on 6.20 CRM. It'll be the Pats taking on the Seattle Thunderbirds. All right. Well, we were talking backup quarterbacks uh, of Saskatchewan lore. Um, he started as a backup, and he's went on to win a couple of Grey Cups and end up in the Plaza of Honor. Our guy, Darian Durant, in a Friday edition of Double Talk is just a couple minutes away. Stick close. This is the all-new Sports Cage on 6.20 CKRM. We're scoreboard watching in the National League Championship Series. Top of the fifth. It was 10-2. It is now 10-5 New York Mets over the L.A. Dodgers. The Dodgers just hit a three-run home run. Man, there's just no defense. <laughs> They're just pitching is awful. There's just no defense in that game. <laughs> uh, the Dodgers are leading that series three games to one. Uh, also coming up tonight, the uh, American League Championship Series. It's game four. The Yankees are leading the Guardians 2-1 after the walk-off win 7-5 last night. For the Cleveland Guardians. Uh, it's Maz and Dave Thomas, the voice of the Riders, host in the all new Sports Cage. Barney will be back in on Monday. And normally on Mondays, we have him on, but it's a special Friday edition with our guy, Darian Durant. All right, let's get to this, Colson. Let's do double talk. 
The all new Sports Cage presents Double Talk with Darian Durand. Brought to you by Wolf Industries, your truck repair specialist in Grenfell. Servicing all sizes of trucks, SGI accredited, and Prairie Land Rentals. Whether it's for the farm or the backyard, Prairie Land Rentals can help with all sizes of jobs. All right, before we get to a football anything, one of the topics on the show yesterday uh, was my wife's like, we got to go get the kids' Halloween costumes because we're less than two weeks away. <laughs> and you're wearing your shirt. It says, girl, dad, you've got three, you've got three girls, Darian. You, you, yeah. What's it like in your house? Do we have costumes secured for the kids for the big day here on the 31st? Yes. Yeah, my wife, she's on top of this stuff before October is over with, you know, I mean, before September is over, I'm sorry. So yeah, she's all over it. And uh, my oldest two, they're gonna be Red and Chloe from The Descendants. And then my baby Zoe, oh. she's gonna be uh, Asha from the movie Wish. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's great. The kids love it. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to having some sweets myself. Now, well, are speaking- you one of those yeah, well, I was just going to say, are you one of those guys that walks around or do you stay home and hand out candy? Like, what, What's your role on Halloween? Are you like the, the no. guy, hey, Dad, hold this, the bag's getting heavy? No, I walk around. I walk around because they're so young right now and they need as much chaperoning as they can get. So, And, and also, you know, the way it is here, a lot of families just leave the candy outside the door. So it's like a free for all. And, and after two or three houses, they have a bag full of candy. So they need my help. So uh, yeah, that's how it is. D- Dave and I's minds are just blown because growing up where we grew up in Saskatchewan, if you left a bowl of candy out, the first <laughs> two kids that come along are emptying that whole thing in the bag. Uh, and yeah. then we'll go yeah. from there. All right. Enough Halloween. Dave, Plaza of Honor question, fire away. Um, it's It was a big well, weekend for Darian last week. First, I guess, speaking of wearing things, Plaza of Honor ring. It was pretty cool. Uh, are, are you wearing it? To, have you put it with the Great Cup rings? Where's the Plaza ring? Yeah, it's, it's, it's right there with it, man. When I, uh, after the induction, I had a small autograph session uh, pre-game and uh, just to see the ring right beside my great cut ring man it was awesome uh, you know when I, I had no idea what to expect coming into the week and, and when I got there just man the riders just treated me just so first class and uh, they laid everything out for me and my mom and uh, you know thanks to Craig and the whole staff for just showing me so much love and the event itself was awesome uh, you know it's it, it's kind of nerve wracking getting up there and speaking in front of your peers and, uh, you know, a group of, of, of people who watched you play. But uh, once I got up there, I usually start sweating as soon as I get on stage. But this time I was cool. Uh, it was more of a sentimental moment for me, just thanking everyone who was responsible for, um, you know, my path, my, my sports path in life. And uh, just so grateful to finally get into the plaza. Well, Darian, I'm not going to put you on the spot, I promise, because it was such an amazing weekend. But, I, I'm not going to say what was your favorite moment, but my favorite moment was what you just alluded to when you were on stage. And it wasn't any part of your speech that stood out for me, although it was spectacular. It was looking <laughs> over and seeing your mom. And it's very hard to see pride, but you could see the pride in her eyes when yeah. she was up there watching you. That was the coolest moment to me. What was her takeaways from the weekend? Wow, she was just blown away as well. I, I think she's been away from the game for so long that, uh, you know, she doesn't really remember how it felt being in Saskatchewan and, and, and the difference that myself and my teammates made in the organization. So she was just blown away by the treatment. And then I think once I got into my speech and, you know, this is the first time she's heard some of the stories that I told, especially the one about my older brother, uh, who was the best athlete in our family. You know, he... You know, he, he, he got kicked out of college um, at the age of 19 and the devastation that she went through. And I never expressed to her, um, you know, how the look on her face made me not want to disappoint her ever again in life. So I think hearing, you know, from the bottom of my heart what she meant to me and everyone that played a role in my path, uh, it was just special for her as well. 
Did you need to keep Mike McCullough away from her so he wouldn't tell any off <laughs> <laughs> jokes? <laughs> well, well, so, so what I, I what I knew going in was that Roy would be your joke guy, right? He keeps the, the crowd, you know, a little on their toes and make sure that they enjoy the laugh. And I would be more your, your, your of your serious guy and more sentimental. So I made sure I keep I kept Mike far away. Now Getz, who's a, a little witty himself. You know, I had to warn him at the beginning of the night. I said, look, you're at my table, but, you know, enough of that joking and laughing because, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is not the time for that. We did that at dinner with doubles, and, uh, you know, this was more of a serious moment for me. <laughs> Mike Mike McCullough was showing Darian's mom uh, his flip phone. It was It's amazing technology yeah. that came out in the year 2002. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it went from yeah, there. Yeah. So I saw. So there was a couple of things. Um, <laughs> I chuckled to myself because we we had you on and we asked you who were to give us your top three players that you had your number your whole career. So I on Saturday at halftime, you're out on the field and you and yeah. Ryan Phillips are sharing a moment. I'm like, Darian, stay away from I Ryan know. Phillips. Nothing good can come from this. <laughs> what? What? If you can share, what was the exchange there? Because it looked like, you know, there was some kind words being shared. Yeah, you know what? Myself and Ryan, even though we had our battles and he's one of the tough, probably the toughest defensive back I've ever played against, our careers ended with our uh, with uh, BC and Saskatchewan, respectively, the same year. So we were, we both traded to Montreal the same year. So we, that's when we began uh, talking a lot more, we became closer, we became good friends, and, uh, you know, it was, now he was my teammate, which is crazy, so, um, you know, it was, it was great just sharing a moment with him, because he's, he's seen my career from the beginning, and, uh, you know, he just told me that I deserved it, uh, I was a hell of a player, and, uh, you know, I just told him I respect what he's doing now, he's the defensive coordinator, one of the youngest, uh, you know, in the league, and, I respect what he's doing. And also another guy that I was able to embrace was John Bowman, who was a CFL Hall of Famer, who, you know, we pretty much entered the year, entered the league the same year as well. And, and I was able to uh, be his teammate in Montreal as well. So it was good seeing all my former teammates and, and guys that I've shared so many battles with. And uh, that's what the league is all about. It's a small league. And, uh, you know, you, you develop lifelong friends throughout. Darian, I thought it was very cool that Trevor Harris – made sure and really sought out a Darian Durant number four jersey yeah. to have an opportunity yeah. to wear it into the stadium and the impact that you had on the team to a man a lot of them talked about your impromptu address to the team on the field during walkthrough were you surprised in anything that you saw in the game the way they came out and played no not at all I think you know this team is getting hot at the right time they're stringing together wins and you know I just wanted to let them know that it's all about confidence at this part of the season, right? It's all about uh, making sure that you're not over cocky. You don't get arrogant because, you know, a lot of times you judge a team based on who beat them. And you can look at Hamilton's record. They had the worst record in the league. And you say, oh, well, Hamilton beat BC. Then we should just walk over BC. And a lot of times when you go into games with that type of arrogance, that's when you get beat up on. So I just wanted to let them know that, like, Get the confidence going. Show BC that you can beat them so that the next time you guys play them, they have that, you know, in the front of their mind, not the back. It's in the front of their mind about, especially when you get a nice butt whipping like what happened last week. Um, you know, <laughs> they'll always remember that. And uh, that's how you develop confidence. And now the team will have that confidence in playing this team again. All right, it's uh, Double Talk for Wolf Industries and Prairie Land Rentals. Darian Durant is with us. It's normally on Mondays. We're doing the Friday edition. You had a busy weekend. I can only imagine how many autographs you signed in the three or four days you were back in Rider Nation. Um, uh, when I saw you at the game uh, Saturday night after all was said and done with a drink in your hand, the guy could tell it was probably a look of relief on your face, like – who you could come down were you surprised not not taking anything away from the riders and how they played were you surprised how badly bc played that just didn't seem like a rick campbell team yeah it, it didn't and uh I, I think sometimes when you see uh you know one of the first plays of the game you throw an interception and it hits your guy right in the chest it bounces off his foot and it, it goes back for a touchdown you can say that you know it, it's just not your day and uh you know 
I think that that's what happened with BC. And I think another thing we have to discuss with BC is just how, you know, I'm speaking from my my uh, perspective only, but how terribly they managed the quarterback situation. I think you have a guy like Vernon Adams yes. who was playing at an MOP level, um, you know, for him to lose his job and, uh, you know, in, in that fashion. And, you know, just the big playability from BC you haven't seen. Uh, Nathan Rourke has four touchdowns and nine interceptions, and uh, I think it's been terribly mishandled. And a guy shouldn't have to lose his job like that. So, um, you know, I, you know, looking forward, I think that if, if Vernon can go out and play well against Montreal, um, you know, you may see Vernon in, in in the playoffs, and I think it'll be a different style of BC offense with Vernon Adams at the quarterback position. Darren, I don't want to be negative Somebody. here, but you've lived firsthand when an organization has brought in a quarterback late in the year. You've been there, and that, that can have so many different ramifications. Are you seeing any similarities to what's happening in BC to what you experienced here? Absolutely, and, and, and it doesn't just affect the quarterback. It affects the entire team. Uh, you know, you, you, you spend all the training camp building chemistry, even in the offseason, Vernon – uh, flies everyone out to Seattle. The receivers, the running backs, they spend a week or two together. They train together. They build this chemistry and camaraderie that it really matters when you get in crunch time situations and games. And I think that you can just see the body language of the receivers. Uh, you look at Hollins and McGinnis. Early on, they were 1-2 uh, in the league in receiving yards and, and, and the stats that they were putting up. I, I saw a crazy stat w which said that uh, Vernon Adams only has 35 more completions than Nathan Rourke, but has over 800 more yards than him. So you could see the big playability that the, the chemistry that these receivers had with Vernon Adams, um, you know, it, it, it just got all messed up when you just throw another quarterback in there. Well, yesterday when we had Glenn Suter on, there was a lot of talk about the Vernon Adams and uh, the Nathan Rourke. And I'm like, yeah, that's two guys, but what about the other 41 guys on the roster and the practice roster? It's so much bigger than that, and you could tell, and Darian, you know this, doesn't matter whether you're at work, you're on a team, even in your family, people segment off into different groups, and they have fans of certain people and other For fans. Sure. Everybody is saying all the right things, but you've been there. You've got to know. Like, this is guys, this is playoff money, this is their jobs on the line, and it's I yeah. I bet you there's a lot of side meetings like hey we're meeting here for lunch after practice because we got to talk about this you got guys probably breaking off all over the place I can only imagine the whatsapp or the text messages going around because yeah, yeah. well no I bet you there is a huge contingent that are VA guys that have not absolutely and bigger, maybe bigger. the first couple of games yeah yeah bigger than that it's even to the point where you'll have a receiver come off the field and if they run a, a certain play that they ran earlier in the season when VA was the quarterback, he would, the receiver will come off and say, I know if you were in there, you would have hit me on that play. You know, it's just little things like that, little chemistry things. Uh, and, and, and Vernon has a big arm, right? So the big playability, Alexander Holland's downfield, uh, McGinnis across the scene, the 20 yard, in routes and, and, and seam routes that he's perfected, you know, early on in this, this season. You don't see that happening with this BC offense. And yeah, you mentioned it. When it comes to guys' livelihood and the money that they make, and, you know, teams that win stay together. And the only way to have a long career is to have success if you're not just an extraordinary athlete. So uh, everything goes hand in hand. And uh, your quarterback is it, it, it's one of the you know, the most important positions on the team. And if you don't have that chemistry with your receivers, then everyone loses. And, and that's how everyone loses their jobs as well. Darian, you have to give credit to Vernon Adams Jr. though, publicly, right? He has said all the right things and done the right things. But I, I would submit that it's got to be eating at him inside, right? With when you're watching and saying, you know, I could do that. How do you go ahead and make sure that those emotions don't consume you? and they don't eat away and deteriorate who you are. Yeah, Vernon's just been the, the ultimate professional. I think even with my time with him, when I was traded to Montreal 
and he had a little success. And then Montreal brought me in to be the starter and then give him a shot. And then he was traded to Sask and he's been, you know, team to team. He's been through it. So for him, for these things to have happened earlier in his career, he knows how to handle it as a veteran. But, you know, when you're 31 years old and you know that your clock is ticking and you're finally starting to have the type of success that could possibly lead you to an MOP, uh, if you look at the numbers, he would have had better stats than Bo at the moment and with more wins. So, you know, the way he's handled it, handled this situation has just been amazing. He's just the ultimate pro. And my hat's off to him because uh, I don't know if I could be as gracious as he as him, uh, especially with, uh, you know, the production that he had early in this season. Well, one of the videos going around on social media, and this I saw this during the football game last week, is um, the guy leading the the team in the in the pregame, getting them all fired up, jumping up and down and doing the dancing. It's it's Vernon Adams Jr. and he wasn't playing, and Nathan Rourke is nowhere in the shot with the rest of the guys, and even like BC yeah. fans are going, why isn't our starting quarterback the one? Like Darian, if when you were the starter for the Riders. They probably didn't go to the third string guy that's been on the practice roster for two weeks to huddle the team before the game to give, you know, whatever words or to to break them down. It just seemed really weird. It's like he's the leader of the team still. He's just he doesn't get any reps. All right. So tonight in Hamilton, Calgary, Hamilton, it's going to be a quarterback carousel offseason. You've got nobody knows what's going on when it comes to the Calgary Stampeders. Matthew Schultz is going to play. Um, Bo Levi Mitchell, who um, is has been benched, who could be MOP type numbers. He's not going to make the playoffs. Is is this a statement game for Bo to be for for both teams to be like you gave up on me and Hamilton? I will show yeah. you. Yeah, I think this is uh, as a competitor, you couldn't ask for a better situation than to be going against your former team. And you have an opportunity to show your home, your new team, and your home fans that you belong, and you, ex- you, you know, you you want to have another year to show what you can do. So um, he's in a great situation, in my opinion, especially for a veteran guy. And uh, you know, you hate to say this, but I'm sure he's happy to see Calgary struggle, struggling right now. Uh, you know, for them to be having quarterback problems, and for them to, uh, you know, felt feel like he's over the over the hill and he can't play anymore. Um, I expect Bo to come out and have a huge game. Uh, I think the over and under on his passing yards was 305. I, I definitely think he will exceed that, and uh, you know, show that he belongs because in the, the second half of the year, he showed that he can still throw up with some of the best of them. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it was just the chemistry. They brought in Chris Jones late as a defensive coordinator. So I think that uh, Hamilton has showed that this team, you know, given uh, off season together, could, could really make some noise next year. Update on the Hamilton game. Uh, it's already 7-zip, seven, seven 66 yards for Bo Levi. There you go. Whoa. There you go. Stat guy yeah. Curtis, ju- stat guy <laughs> Curtis jumping in. Um, <laughs> It's it's been kind of sad watching the Ottawa Red Blacks crumble down the stretch here. A lot of people think that they will end up losing to Toronto tomorrow, which means they will not have a home playoff game. They will play Toronto, and the Toronto is going to win the East semifinal. Do you see anything in the Red Blacks to make you think that they're going to win one of the next two football games? Well, the the only good thing they have going is that they're six and one at home uh, and one tie. Of course, so uh, they have turned, uh, you know, their stadium into a home field advantage. So I think that, uh, you know, and Coach Dice has coached in a whole bunch of big games. I think they need to settle in on who's their quarterback moving forward and, 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 you know, who they choose to lead the team because that's very important. It's kind of the same situation that's in, um, you know, BC. You know, guys feel for Masoli and know that he has the experience and want to see him play. But Drew Brown showed earlier in this season that he can get it done and he can play at a high level. So, you know, it's a tough situation. I I still think Toronto is the better team. But, you know, anything can happen and Ottawa's at home. And, uh, you know, the least that can happen is, you know, we're going to get a good game. That's the main thing. And and, and, uh, I'm excited to see what happens with that game. Uh, Darian Durant of here in Saskatchewan, the Rough Riders are on a bye week. I'm not sure if a late season bye week is a good thing or a bad thing, but I am 
fascinated by what the approach of this team might be next week because they will know before they go on the field, but not before they go on the field, if you know what I mean, as to whether or not they've still got a a shot at first place in the West Division. Also, you want to make sure that you protect the players because you don't want anybody getting injured going into the playoffs, a game that you know you're going to host. But also you want to make sure you're continuing rolling. How do you balance all of those? Yeah, it's a tough thing to balance. and And I think that you know, when you're only dressing 42 or 44 guys, you know, you can't have backups for every single position. So some of your key guys are going to have to play regardless. So, um, you know, but but it's good that they can find out beforehand what their situation is. I was thinking back to the BC game this past week and those hits that Trevor took, um, you know, late in the game when the game was over. Um, you know, you don't want to see that. And I'm sure that, um, you know, Coach Mace will, will do a good job of protecting Trevor, you know, if Winnipeg wins and, and uh, there's no chance of them locking up uh, the Western final. So we'll see how it goes. And uh, it, it's just a, it's a, a fine line that you have to play, you know, on, on both sides. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's a tough situation. But you, if there's anyone you have to protect, it's Trevor Harris. He's hot. He's over 75% over the past four games and um, you know he's a guy that you can't afford to lose right now I know the competitor that you are so if you go ahead and you're preparing for this week number one how do you prepare and number two what would you have wanted to do if you could put yourself in the spot of Trevor Harris well, first of all, I would have wanted to come out of that BC game a little bit earlier, or we run the ball late nice. instead of me taking those hits. But uh, nice. but if I'm Trevor, you know, I, you know what? It, it, you don't want to get rusty when you're when you're firing and you're clicking, and and the game has slowed down for you like it has for Trevor. You know, you want to get as many reps as you can with the guys to build that chemistry. And, uh, you know, hopefully it's cold and it's windy and you can get a, a, a playoff type atmosphere uh, preview going so you can, you know, get a feel for what it'll be like. So, uh, like I said, it, 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 it's, it's hard to say, but if I'm Trevor, I want to play at least a half. If there's, you know, if, it, if it's a meaningless game, I will want to get a half in, you know, continue to build that chemistry and, and, and get those reps going and then uh, rest up and get ready for the, the West semifinal, if that's the case. And if I'm one of the receivers, I'm telling you as the quarterback, um, we're only throwing out routes. I'm not running across the middle. <laughs> You're nuts. I'll fake a leg injury, a hammy. I'm going to go down and I'll be on the bench over there. Yeah. But I am not doing seven yards across the middle. Okay. Absolutely. Michael, I'll wait. Coaches, have, bear, bear coaches have double ga- double game plans, right? They have a game plan for if they really need the game and they have the they, they need certain plays and if the game is out of reach and the backups need to play to have a certain game plan for that as well. Do, we, oh, do hey, they have a uh, game re- plan as well when it comes to protecting their playbook? <laughs> I.e., I don't want to show too much late in the season, even though you've already played 17 games? See, the pro- I think the problem with this is going to be you're playing against Calgary, right? You're playing against a team who guys are fighting for their pro lives right now. So... Uh, you know, there may be some dirtiness, there may be some chippiness, some late hits. Uh, it would be different if you're playing against a team that already clinched and they're resting their guys. But when you're playing against a team where guys are fighting for their jobs and their livelihoods, you never know what to expect. So I would definitely want to protect Trevor in these situations, especially against a team that has nothing to lose. All righty. It's double talk for Wolf Industries and... Uh... Fairyland Rentals. Uh, Darian, as always, uh, we'll wrap on this. A quick NFL note. Do the Minnesota Vikings stay undefeated? Or did the – your brother played for the Lions, didn't he, for for a bit, didn't he? Yes, he did. He, he, he did three yes, he years. Did. Do, yeah. do, yeah. do Dan Campbell and the Detroit Lions knock off the Minnesota Vikings this week? Man, if I was a betting guy, I would say yes, just because – they're battle tested. They've been in NFC championships and what they went down to Dallas and did last week to the Cowboys was just Ooh. embarrassing uh, for the Cowboys. So if I was a betting man, I put <laughs> my money on Detroit, but Minnesota's hot, man, and they're looking good. So um, it, it, it's a tough one, but I'm looking forward to a good game. That's what it's all about for me. Two of the best teams in the league going at it and uh, it's going to be a good one. 
Well, and it's crazy that Jerry Jones, like it was such an embarrassing blowout. I don't know if you heard it. We, we, I think we have the audio. We'll play it before the end of the show. Jerry Jones on his radio show the next day threatened to fire the radio guys like us who they pay to ask the questions wow. <laughs> because they asked about the game and how bad it was. That's how bad things are in Jerry world these days. I don't yeah, think he's yeah. going to win GM executive of the year in the NFL. It's three decades of Jerry wow. running this thing into the ground. And that was a tough football game to watch just all around. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. a tough yeah. football game to watch. Ooh. Uh, all right, yeah. my man. Uh, we'll let you get back to being a girl dad, as always. If you've missed yes. any part of Double Talk, you can always catch the podcast at sportscage.com. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to chat with Brendan McGuire, who's the voice of the University of Regina Rams. They're in Regina tomorrow to take on the U of S Huskies. We'll get a little game preview from BMAC in just a couple of minutes. This is the all-new Sports Cage on 620 CKRM. All new Sports Cage scoreboard National League Championship Series. What are we going into the seventh inning here? It's the Mets 11 and the Dodgers 6. The Dodgers have it in them to come back. Oh, anyways, mm. uh, I, st- I still think being down 3 1 and they got to go back to LA, it's going to be tough for the Mets to mount a comeback. Uh, first pitch in the uh, American League Championship Series goes at 6 08 tonight Guardians and Yankees. And in the CFL, Bo Levi Mitchell is 8 for 9 for 107 yards, two touchdowns late in the first quarter. It's the Hamilton Ticats 14, the Calgary Stampeders, no score. In the Bo Levi Mitchell, you shouldn't have never dumped me, you should have never benched me, (laughs) revenge game, according to Darian Duran. Ah, I love doubles. Ah, I love talking to him. Just such a good dude. If you missed any part of Double Talk with Darian Duran, you can always go back and listen to the Sports Cage uh, podcasts. You can find them on Spot or wherever you find your podcasts, and you can get them at sportscage.com. All right. Uh, tomorrow is a Saskatchewan grudge match when it comes to university football, and we're bringing in this guy because he's going to have the game. The University of Regina Rams and the U of S Huskies tomorrow, 1245 here on CKRM, 1 o'clock kickoff. We bring in voice of the Rams, Brendan McGuire on the Western Pizza guest hotline. First off, Mr. McGuire. Oh, you guys, did you guys do the trip early? But, okay, first question. First season call in Rams football. How's it been so far? I'm having a blast. I, I thought it would be like the good old days of riding the iron lung in junior hockey. And this is way better than that because when you go, they take two buses. So you get two seats to yourself. So you can actually stretch out. Not like when you get on the bus with the Weyburn Red Wings or Esteban Bruins or Windsor Spitfires where they scrunch two seats together. So uh, it's been great. It's like I get the, the glory of doing a broadcast and going to places like Calgary and Winnipeg, which doesn't sound all that fancy, but when you compare it to, I don't know, Kindersley, Flin Flon, LaRange, it's pretty good. <laughs> so I have no complaints. <laughs> Speaking of the bus, there's three towns that just went under the bus, according to Brendan McGuire. Um, so you guys are up there. To, it's a big game tomorrow. I mean, the Rams, the playoffs, everything. The Rams need to beat the Huskies tomorrow. But it, it's not that easy. What are the Rams going to have to do to beat a, a U of S Husky team that started slow, but they seem to be going in the right direction as we come to the end of the season here? You wouldn't think a three and three team against a two and four team would be a prime time matchup, but when you're the broadcaster, you try to frame it any way you can. And the Huskies have probably the most dynamic offense in Canada West, and the Rams, I would say, probably have one of the top two defenses. So that's one way of looking at it. The Rams have never swept the Huskies before in two regular season meetings. They could be first. They could make history. And uh, I chatted with John Ryan earlier today, which you'll hear on the halftime of the broadcast tomorrow. But we remembered that when the Rams went to the Vanier Cup in 2000, their record through six games was two and four. So maybe there's a little bit of life there. Uh, I think more than anything, the Rams have to keep Riker Frank, the running back of the Huskies, in check. They did that in week two of the season. And Frank has been the foundation of that Husky offense. When they get that run game going, and Dave knows this about the Huskies, that's been their DNA for a really long time, that's when everything else opens up. And because they couldn't get him going early in the season, that's why they were struggling. I do wonder if the Rams 
need to channel some of that good feeling they had the first two weeks. When we went into Calgary, they had over 7,000 people there because it was the new student orientation night. It was their home opener. So there was a big crowd. There was lots to play for. And then in week two, it was the home opener. The weather was perfect. Lots of people came down from Saskatoon. There was another big crowd, and they pulled out a victory that night too. They haven't really played in front of an audience like that since. So this will probably be as reminiscent of those first two games as far as the atmosphere, especially since the last time I checked the forecast, it's actually supposed to be pretty nice, and there should be a big crowd. They're not going to have their number one quarterback, Owen Sieben. They still haven't ruled him out for the seat for the year, um, but it's Noah Pelche again, and I think they're just going to have to look at that blueprint from week two and try to duplicate that again. Brandon, the outside looking in synopsis that I'll provide is in week one, to me, the Regina Rams rallied around the fact that they had lost their quarterback and they came to play for Noah Pelche and they really seemed like a solid group. In week two, despite facing adversity and a charge mounted by the Saskatchewan Huskies, I thought this team had found their confidence and, and their voice, if you know what I mean. Since then, has this team kind of lost a little bit of that confidence or, or where is the confidence level of the Rams at? 100%. That UBC game was like a dagger. I think they felt like they had it in their mitts, and that was a turning point for both teams. UBC was 0-2. They hadn't been playing well. They had lost their two best O-linemen to the NFL, as you'll remember, and uh, they were just finding themselves a little bit. So they came into Regina 0-2. The Rams were 2-0, and feeling great, and there were two costly turnovers late. There was the one fumble by Javon Garwood, and then there was also uh, the strip sack fumble as well. And they ended up losing, I think it was 14-12 was the final. And you know how that feeling is. It's almost better to get blown out than to lose like that. And it just seems like that took the wind out of their sails because they had it in their mitts and they just haven't been able to recover since. But more than anything, the offense has to score more points. They've been averaging 12 points a game. Uh, they were gifted uh, pick six early in the game against the Dinos and still weren't quite able to pull it out. More than anything, they have been, when you think of what stat, are they not running the ball well enough? Are they not passing the ball well enough? And I, there's probably some of that. The passing game is not what it needs to be. But more than anything, they're just not getting the timely play when they need it. Um, I didn't check, the, I don't remember the stats from the last game, but the three games before that, the opposition was averaging eight more first downs than the Rams were. And, and it's not that their defense isn't playing well. There were times that they couldn't stop the run at Edmonton. There's times where they just couldn't get off the field. But overall, it's been the Rams' inability to sustain drives and get that extra five yards, three yards, whatever it is, when they need it. They're just not finding the sticks, particularly on second down. Brendan McGuire joins us on the Western Pizza Guest Hotline. He's the voice of the University of Regina Rams. Tomorrow, taking on the Huskies. We're going to have the pregame show on 620 CKRM at 1245, play-by-play -play at 1. It's funny, you mentioned wind and blown away. To me, in the UBC game was tough. The wind bowl in Regina a few weeks ago when they were taken on, the where, like I said, not scoring points. First of all, for anybody that wasn't, describe how windy the conditions were that day at Mosaic Stadium. Because that was some of the craziest weather, I think, for for anybody to play a football game in. I, I realized when my daughter's little playhouse blew from one side of the backyard to the other that we were in for something unique. And people were asking me, <laughs> are, they, are, are, are they even going to play this game? And I knew they would if they could, right? Just logistically. And, and the wind was supposed to stay high all day long. It's not like you could delay it a couple hours and then get it in and under any better conditions. First of all, I'm going to say it was a real tribute to the engineering of the stadium because if that game had been played at Old Taylor Field, that would have been unbelievable. It might have been a joy to watch just how unique it would have been because you'll remember for a long time, those end zones were wide open and it was built kitty corner. One end zone was to the northwest, which is where the wind comes in at, at its strongest. And uh, whereas this stadium is built into the ground, it's north-south. And when I was in the parking lot, there were people literally falling over. And it was that bad. And I was trying to shut the door on my car. It was a struggle. Once you got into the park, it wasn't bad. It really wasn't. Bids and I had a, an open debate over whether the, uh, the window should be open or not. I wanted to experience the ambiance and, 
I don't blame him for not wanting to, but we compromise. Sometimes that's what moves us along in life. And we open one of the windows and not the other. We probably could have left them both shut. Um, so, but, but it was still, <laughs> I, I also, uh, I, I emailed that day, Steve Daniel, the CFL's chief statistician to ask him, you know, I don't know if you have these stats, but what is the windiest day in Canadian football history? And he cited a game from 1998, I believe it was, when wind gusts got as high as 95 clicks, 93 clicks. Mm. And on this day, they got up to 95 clicks. So was it the windiest day in, in football history? Maybe. Was it the windiest game? Definitely not because of the way the stadium was engineered. And it's a tribute to both teams that there were so many points scored. I think everybody was surprised. Um, it wasn't a high-scoring game, but 23-20 in those conditions – I thought was pretty remarkable. Well, I get that it's 2024, and it's been a while since I was in university, but uh, back in my day, there were lots of people that were falling down after football games, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I know. (laughs) I I do want to ask you, though, about the front seven defensively. I know that Coach McConkie took a lot of pride in his offseason recruiting and bringing in some guys that were a little bit older, a little more experienced that could go ahead and provide some pressure and some stability on the defensive side of the football. How has that gone? Well, I just talked to our good pal Vincent Donaldson, who works with the defensive backs, and he just raves about the pass rush, particularly Tarek Polius. And uh, I, there's no bigger fan of him than I, because as the broadcaster, I learned in week one that his nickname is Cookie. So who's been waiting for 50 years since Cookie Gilchrist to say, looky, looky, here comes Cookie. And I got to do it a couple of times uh, with the sacks that he got against uh, UBC. So he's been, he's been a big pickup. And, and the, uh, the other guy, and he's a Toronto guy who played junior football with uh, West Shore Rebels last year out in, out in BC. And the other guy they got was Praise Odigan. And those two wreak havoc uh, along that defensive line. And, you know, when it comes to a pass rush, people forget, you can't, or uh, sorry, uh, secondary coverage and pass rush. You can't have one without the other. So those guys, you look at the success of that secondary, it's largely because of the pass rush. And I'm glad you brought that up, Dave, because maybe their best defensive player overall you could make the argument has been linebacker Garrett Hatcher and he's been out the last couple of games he's the one guy coming back off the injured list for this game in Saskatoon and uh boy it couldn't come at a moment uh too soon I mean they they need him because they need this game Saturday all right, uh, he's Brendan McGuire. Brendan, he is the voice of the uh, University of Regina Rams here on 620 CKRM. Brendan, we're going to let you go. Go to Fuddruckers and get a half-pound burger for me. You use the name Elvis P so they can announce that on the sound system. The Elvis P, your order is ready. Uh, do that, and we look forward to the call tomorrow. 12.45 pregame show. It'll be uh, Mr. McGuire and Derek Bidwell with the kickoff going at 1 o'clock. All right, man, the show has flown by today. We only got a few minutes left. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll wrap. It's the all-new Sports Cage right here on the home of local sports in Saskatchewan, 620 CKRM. Uh, Bo Levi Mitchell is going off in Hamilton. It's 20 nothing. Bo Levi is 13 for 15, 231 yards, three touchdowns, 15.4-yard average. I think if things keep going well, he's going to break that 305 prop rep that uh, they had up earlier today. I wonder if Dave Dickinson has noticed that at all. <laughs> well, I'm surprised that Su- when when we, we asked Suter about Dickinson yesterday, I thought he was going to be like, ah, no, Dave's fine. Eh, it's all good. No, there's no, it's it, it's not because it's not just this year. It's last year and even the year before that when the in the final year of Bo. And I was like, oh, maybe there's more to it than that. Um, Make that uh, four touchdowns. Wow. Aye, aye, Stephen aye. Dunbar. Aye. I Poppy, 14 of 16, 237, four touchdowns. With 10 minutes left Yikes. in the second quarter? Second quarter, yeah. Yeah, uh, not second half, second, second quarter. quarter. Yeah. In the second quarter. Um, the provincial election is in 10 days. Are you guys getting a lot of calls to your cell phones for political surveys and stuff? I just got one here. Uh, not calls, and, uh, they did, but uh, well, they, Colson got they left a text a, they, and was complaining right before the show. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't sign up for emails or texts. No, thank you. <laughs> wow. Well, no, and and here's the thing. I don't know if you guys are homeowners, but Dave, have you ever been an election sign person in your front yard? We never have. Not not as kids growing up and not now. No, my dad was. My dad was an election oh, really? sign guy back in the day, but it would change every election. <laughs> so, yeah, no. 
So who was it back then? I mean, the, the parties have changed in the people, but who were, who were, did you guys support then? Back in the day, all of them, seriously. Like he would switch every election. Like, and it wasn't necessarily that's because of who he was supporting or anything, but he put up a liberal sign one day, put up a PC sign the next, then and, and just to mess with people. Like, nice. <laughs> I know, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, just where the world is at these days, like, see, you know what, with neighbors and all that, like uh, where we live in our cul-de-sac, everybody is non-committal to, not, not provincial, not federal, not anything. And, and maybe, and that's maybe the good thing, just go and do your business and go and do your thing. But you usually think, hey, do you have time for a quick one-question survey? It's like, ah, no, the only reason I answered is because I thought you were the kid's school calling that there was a problem, and so I, I needed to rush to school. I got sucked into that earlier today. Uh, it's been a good couple of days here on the Sports Cage. Barney will be back on Monday. Uh, thanks to Dave. Thanks to Colson. Thanks to Curtis. Thanks to you if you've been watching at SportsCage.com, if you've been listening on 620 CKRM. And we are going to wrap with the Major League Baseball report and our own Mr. Baseball, Dave Thomas. I'm Dave Thomas, and it's time for your Major League Baseball report for Short E Generators. Keep the power in your hands with an automatic standby generator from Short E Generators, the standby generator experts. The final four teams in the Major League Baseball playoffs aren't disappointing. Let's start in the American League Championship Series, where the Cleveland Guardians scored a major Game 3 win last night to cut New York's lead in the best of seven to two games to one. The Yankees took a 5-3 lead into the bottom of the ninth inning. That was until Gian Kenzie Noel came to the plate with one on and two out. Oh! Oh, oh my goodness! Big Christmas has tied it! The ultimate present under the tree! <laughs> oh my goodness! John Kenzie Noel! The biggest swing of his life! That knock sent the game into extra innings, and in the bottom of the 10th, David Fry came to the dish. Fry, deep drive, left field, Fry's watching, it is a walk-off home run! David Fry lights up the Cleveland night! David Fry continues to put his name in Cleveland's postseason highlight reel. And Fry says that Cleveland's belief in their dugout is now unwavering. Obviously, after they took the lead, it was tough, but uh, we still felt like we had a good chance. It's kind of who we've been all year. We come back, and, I mean, if there was a guy who can hit a big homer, it's Sean Kinsey, and golly, he did. The Guardians, who won that game 7-5, will host Game 4 in the series tonight. Over in the National League, the Los Angeles Dodgers, they're just one win away from being in the World Series and they'll visit the New York Mets today to try to accomplish it. The Dodgers gave the Mets a 10-2 thrashing last night to take a 3-1 lead in the National League Championship Series. L.A. has outscored the Mets 18-2 in their last two games, and veteran Mookie Betts likes the way his Dodgers are playing no matter who steps up. I felt pretty good. You know, it's good to feel good. It's good to help the team. Um, and pitching, pitching did amazing, uh, keeping them off the board, really. So, uh, you know, it, it was fun. That's the beauty of our, our team. It can change, but uh, whoever's in the lineup is good, and they're going to follow the plan. They're gonna, uh, they are gonna they want to win, and so uh, that's why we're that's why we, uh, are up 3-1 to one right now. Game four of that series is in Queens today. And that's the Major League Baseball report. For Shorty Generators, keep the power in your hands with an automatic standby generator from Shorty Generators, the standby generator experts.